Início a mais uma importante mesa nesse evento, chamada Ciência Cidadã e Educação Aberta, coordenado pela professora Sarita, que é coordenadora do LINC, que comemora esse ano 10 anos de sua criação, com muito êxito e uma referência na área da ciência da informação, e em parceria com o IBICT, em parceria com a Open Knowledge do Brasil, com o grupo de trabalho Ciência Aberta e com a coordenação de educação à distância da Universidade Federal do Estado do Rio de Janeiro. Esse tema do seminário surge essencialmente da proposta sintetizada por Michael Nilsson, de que o conhecimento científico de todos os tipos deve ser compartilhado abertamente, tão cedo quanto praticável no processo de descoberta. Temos conosco, por ordem de apresentação das palestras nessa manhã, os professores Denise Aquera, que é PHD em Ciência da Informação, professora assistente da Universidade Nacional de Singapura e membro do Instituto de Pesquisa da Ásia. O professor David Cavallo, PHD em Artes e Ciências pelo MIT, é professor também visitante da Universidade Federal do Sul da Bahia. A professora Ellen, Ellen Dias Georges, PHD em Biologia Celular e Molecular, cofundadora e diretora executiva do GeneSpace. É professora também do New York Medical College. E o professor Henrique Parra, doutor em Educação, e professor do curso de Ciências Sociais da Universidade Federal de São Paulo, Unifesp, e coordenador do Pimenta Lab, Laboratório de Tecnologia Política e Conhecimento. So, thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm really happy to see you, Ludmila, Sarita, and Luca, and Ale, and all this girl power you have here around innovation studies and open science studies. I have really high hopes for uh, this field in Brazil after seeing that. So uh, what I'll try to present today is a piece of some, some new obsession I have, and it will be on open science and strangely patents, actually. Um, so I see some interesting interaction between hardware and open science in some recent projects, and I decided to call this strange interaction as something of patent zombies, uh, chimeras, and future monsters. So where do I come from? I have a day job as a university professor, but actually I'm also a member of certain open science organizations such as Hacteria, which is an open biology network. It's a global network of people interested in open science and citizen science that has to do anything with bio. Um, because I'm originally from Prague, I'm a member of a hackerspace, Bermelab, that no one can pronounce. <laughs> and then I'm a supporter of this organization called Hackademia which is trying to organize workshops, especially for kids and their parents. So they have, I think Marcella, she's not here, but that's something interesting for some of you. And I'm some strange breed of philosopher and a designer. So somehow in my life I'm moving to fields that I know little about, but they excite me. And this is how my research into hardware and open science started. For some years now, I was interested how, in, uh, how, how does it, in places like Indonesia, how people start building their own laboratory equipment and what does it mean for science and what does it mean for the community there. So I was following an organization called Life Patch in Indonesia and I tried to define something like a life cycle of such open hardware lab equipment. It's basically people building infrastructure to do science in places where it's um, unavailable, expensive, or for various reasons missing. And the life cycle, it starts with the workshop where people learn how to make it. Then they build their own prototypes, their own version of that tool. Then you see some educational use, so they spread it to children, workshops. Some artists appropriate it. 
um, we see some interesting like design use. And after that, you have that stage when people start thinking, oh, it, can this be something useful? Can we do some real research with that? And I see evidence that this can even move into some forms of, let's say, bio-entrepreneurship in, in that context. So an example I'll show you to summarize this research I've done so far, and I published something around it. You can find all my texts in academia. It's basically do-it-yourself microscopes, and I do believe that's the most disruptive technology in European history and around the world. Microscopes is where science starts. I hope none of the scientists will be angry at this stage, and uh, maybe they have some other fetish. So um, it will be about DIY microscopes and how they serve education and how they became uh, this tool for uh, basically counting colonies of bacteria or some other animals on, on that micro scale. So this is the organization LifePatch. This is Akbar, who is in the present time in Japan, finishing his MA, I think. And he's a researcher at a local university, but also an avid citizen science in this organization that is based in a neighborhood in Georgia Carta, which is central Java, and where our network bacteria often meets and where we do some workshops with other people. Um, so uh, it's called Bugisan. And it all started in 2009 when a Swiss um, a PhD in nanoscience uh, uh, guy came to Georgia Carta and he met some local uh, in people interested in citizen science and they shared with him that they have a problem getting microscopes. So this is what they did. They hacked the webcam, which is a very common thing. And the first thing you do to uh, create a microscope, then they use some better webcams, as you can see this uh, PS3 iGame console. And this was happening at the university. So they were starting to build these microscopes, but the first, and, and yeah, the Actually, the most difficult thing about this DIY microscope is building the stage because um, uh, you need something movable so you can focus well. So this stage became also a means of communication between different citizen science organizations. So they created different clones. I particularly like this one because it was made by a local artisan, so it wasn't laser cut it or anything. It was made uh, by a local, basically, glass maker. And yeah, so the first use were these microscope, microscopy workshops with children, especially children with special needs around Georgia Carta. And there were hundreds of these workshops. It's like amazing how these workshops and these microscopes were spreading over Indonesia, where kids could see this microorganism for the first time. Then you could see um, examples of artistic use of VJing with these microscopes. So some pure data software that was tracking the organisms and they were making noise or was used for this type of effect. And this is what happened like uh, maybe I'm, I think this is back in 2012 or 13 when uh, some of the researchers start using these microscopes for research they were doing in the University of Gajamada in Jakarta is one of the best biotech departments there. And they decided to do this uh, colony counting through these DIY microscopes, which helped them for something actually useful. They do a lot of microbiology research. They're especially interested in bacteria that do soil remediation after volcanic ash destroys the soil, or they try, they work a lot with soil bacteria. So, um, and, and then, yeah, some of them actually developed this into some bioentrepreneurship project, or they do also a lot on fermentation, so they uh, make ferment like local wine and so on. So I was actually impressed by this development of... Um, Something we can call a messy open source hardware. It's uh, more like reappropriation of technologies that exist, like webcams and maybe some stages which are uh, uh, shared on this open source manner. And I started looking more into these open source hardware issues. And over the years, I became more interested in how these open source tools and this infrastructure can, can actually support, or that's a strong thesis, support research infrastructure in the global south. And then I have some particular interest in traditional crafts and open hardware. And also I'm a collector of these do-it-yourself biology prototypes. I try to um, organize exhibitions around them and build something of an archive. And actually one of my microscope was adopted here in Brazil by Yuri and Marcela. I hope you guys take good care of that Indonesian microscope. <laughs> 
So this is what we mean by open hardware usually. It's this easy prototyping microcontroller platforms call, called Arduino. Imagine them as some simple basically computers that allow you to connect an LED or sensor and do something fun. Of course, some form of a technology that lets you print in plastic or cut in some material um, shapes of um, things you need to build something. And then maybe what is... I'm, becoming more interested in is like designing your own circuits, like designing your own unique piece of technology. Basically, after you prototype it here, you build something here, you may decide to create like your own chip, basically. So this is, and, and you share, of course, all the schematic and the design of your interventions. So, um, because this panel is on education, I'll mention something interesting that happens uh, when you start engaging with open hardware as an educator or as, as a person interested in it for whatever reason. And it is, the basic lesson you learn is actually that it's not that open as we call it, and maybe it's not even technology. And that is what I'll present today. I will call it a patent zombie uh, because it's often built on something of, of uh, expiring patents such as the MakerBot, all this 3D making stuff is actually a patent zombie. Then you will find that many of these uh, so-called open source things are actually something like semi-open. Certain parts are not really open. In most cases, they're not open. And uh, what I will argue for is that we need maybe even more hybrids or more monsters which we need to test in order to understand the legal challenges and the opportunities, um, to build like some new stakeholders relations around open hardware, and basically to use them, let's use that Marxist terms, tools of production. So for me, open hardware is really about taking the tools of production of all electronics at the end. And this is the hypothesis. I believe that these monsters, hybrids around open hardware and patents support technological transfer. Uh, in, in all contexts, north-south. In one sense, uh, they support transfer of emergent technologies, and I'll show some biosensors, but also, and this is what maybe is more exciting for us right now, unique infrastructure which enables these not only north-south um, networks, but also south-south networks. Methods I'm using, it is ethnography, I also organize hackathons, and this I will not talk about it, but some people that are maybe interested in policy, I believe this offers some opportunity for experimental policy, which is not based on some anticipations or fears, but really tries to experiment with some exactly like new relations with, between stakeholders and so on. So what are these emergent teams or hybrids of uh, patents and open hardware I see? Uh, oops. It's um, uh, technology transfer between open hardware and patents, especially around biosensors. I see some interesting uses of rural hacker spaces, which actually one of them is here, and I hope to learn more about from these guys there in the corner. I'll reveal your identity. You have real rural hacker spaces here. For example, very interesting project that is starting to emerge are these spectrometers and um, soil bioprospecting, where I'm more involved in as, uh, as someone organizing students and some groups of people that try to develop something of an open antibiotics discovery, where we try to do soil samples, we build incubators to do some microbiology experiments, and we try to find antibiotics, basically. So these are the case studies I'll shortly mention, open beehives projects where there is a pesticide biosensor that will be transferred through open hardware, I hope. That's the experiment I want to run. There is a case study I'm following in Japan around Quantum Biosystem. It's a company uh, which has an interesting nanopore sequencing technology patent, and they hired some open hardware developers to help them make it like a real tool and engage a community around it, and this BioStrike global project of open antibiotics discovery. So Open Beehive's project started with this organization called Open Tech Forever, and uh, if you, you may know about open ecology, open source ecology projects, these guys that are building a lot of open source tools to do agriculture. So they share the design of agricultural machines. So one of their, they split and now part of them are somewhere in Denver and they decided we want beehives and we want to share design of beehives, but not just any beehives, beehives that also take sensory measurements. So they're working with some uh, group in Barcelona on this um, uh, 
smart citizen platform for sharing crowdsourcing data about your environment, and they approached me actually because I'm based in Singapore, asking for a contact with this professor there uh, who developed a pesticide biosensor. And what happens often is he published a paper where he was able to prove, yes, I have something that can measure pesticides, but he just had a prototype to write a paper, he patented it, and for years nothing is going on. And the sad truth is all these patents basically end up as these concepts that the university claims they have and the researcher, but never makes it into a real tool. And I was very skeptical in the beginning because I was convinced, uh, you know, I'll come there and he will ask for a lot of money and he will not be really interested to cooperate with some open hardware hackers in the US and who knows where. But he was incredibly friendly, incredibly curious about the project and we are really moving on with this, trying to get some funding so uh, we can do these workshops where he will bring his pesticide sensor and we will try to build some tool which will be useful for these beehives, basically. Because there is a lot of issues which are still actually scientific, not maybe even transfer related, whether the sampling of the uh, biosensor can work with uh, pollen, because he was testing it on a local juice in our canteen. So um, there are a lot of, so I think there are a lot of these biosensors which can benefit benefit from open hardware developers and I personally don't have a problem that this little pesticide sensor and this little piece of um, technology that it's an original design of some professor at the university will remain for now maybe closed or it, it, where he will ask for some money for the pesticide sensor if he doesn't want to you know uh, patent the whole tool or the whole beehives project. Okay, maybe more interesting is this example, quantum biosystems in Japan, which um, actually are developing a very um, disruptive technology. So um, all DNA sequencing technology right now with uh, the PCR machines, they need some chemicals to run that, um, that processes and it's quite expensive to do it. And in most places like in Indonesia, it's almost like unachievable for especially citizen science organizations because even if they build the open PCR tool, they will not get the reagents. And these reagents are a it's a really difficult thing to get in, uh, in these countries. So um, nanopore sequencing is an interesting technology because you will not need reagents to run any DNA analysis. And uh, here is like some uh, description how it works. It's a patented technology where it tries, which tries to cut the DNA molecule on this uh, nano level, basically, and give you immediate data through some electric current, basically what type of a molecule is going through that uh, sensor or through that chip. So uh, they believe they have this breakthrough in molecular sensing and uh, they will be able to uh, create this new generation of sequencing technology. These are some images I found on their website. Basically, it gives you an idea. It looks a bit like this microfluidic chip or these biosensor technologies, but it happens on some nano level. And um, uh, what interests me about this technology is uh, there are actually two companies right now that claim they have some patents around uh, this type of sequencing technology. But this company is interesting for me because they actually involved open hardware developers, quite famous open hardware developers, to run the test. So it's Bunny Huang and then Akiba, the guy who started the Tokyo hackerspace. Chris Wang, he's like American Chinese who is in, based in Japan. And, and the interesting thing is that Akiba uh, he, uh, he, right now he's also running a, a, a hacker farm or this rural hacker farm near Tokyo and for him the work on this nano sequencing technology is the way how to fund his rural hacker space. This is from a conversation we had, we had where I asked him, okay, what is your relation with, the, with this company? And he says, yes, I'm basically hired to develop some infrastructure that will be able to read that um, uh, micro signal. It's like some form of a piezo mechanism on that nano uh, biosensor, which you need a tool to read it, give you the, the data, so this works. So um, this is some pictures. I'll just go quickly through them. So for me, it's interesting how this disruptive biotech will actually feed that hackerspace rural thing. He posts a lot on Facebook through the project. It's possible to follow it. It's like really interesting to follow it, actually. Uh, this is some, this is how that chip nanoglass, 
nanopore test samples on silicon substrates. So they're already testing the technology. And I think the biggest challenge was really reading these signals and giving some presentation of them. And okay, this is important. They, uh, the whole company, um, quant uh, these quantum uh, biosystems, they're trying actually to invite other open hardware developers or any researchers. And, and they're telling them, okay, guys, we'll give you something. You will have to pay something. But on, based on it, you can develop some other things. So in that sense, it's a hybrid of uh, sensor. Okay, there are more of these hybrids. I think I have five more minutes. I'll try to finish on time. Um, I'm starting to be really curious about this open hardware, uh, chimeras, monsters, whatever you will call them. And recently I saw a tool which offers, I don't completely like the way they work. It's called Marblar. It's a service which invite scientists or big institutions to submit their patents online and invite other researchers and developers to make something marketable or something that can be useful for humanity and it's not just a paper or a patent. So this was their original websites and they tried to gamify the experience and I didn't feel it was completely okay because they were like, yeah, just give us the idea and you will meet the inventors and maybe join a startup. It was, wasn't completely clear how they want to do it. And um, this, this would be like an example. This is from some media. When you Google it, you'll find it. This is an, an example of a scenario they were hoping to achieve. And, um, okay, these are more examples. I tried actually very little you can find right now because right now the website looks like this. You cannot click to anything, you cannot see the patterns, nothing. So for me it's a bit strange that before, if you go to the Wayback Machine, you can see they were sharing quite a lot on these patterns. They are trying to transfer through this website, but right now there is nothing. Um, another interesting um, way maybe of uh, uh, doing this... Um, Another interesting license or an example of a service, I, I'm curious to see whether it can enable these hybrids, is this new license for open hardware development. It's called Defensive Patent License. There will be a big conference in November somewhere in Silicon Valley around it, and it wants to enable open hardware developers to create something like portfolio of, of uh, inventions they have in order to fight the real patents and be protected in case they want to develop anything on it. So I can imagine even some hybrids between patents and this DPL license technologies. And this will be my last few minutes. I'm, I'm actually also working on some projects. And this was interesting for me because it was touching a lot of these issues of uh, open source ver versus patented technology. And it has to do with antibiotics. So over the last year, uh, quite a global community from Europe, Israel, um, Asia, from everywhere actually, this, uh, got excited about this idea. Why people cannot, you know, uh, get like, because all antibiotics are actually from our soils and they got patented by pharma companies as, as antibiotics. But the original protocols through which you identify an antibiotic, and there are probably millions of them in our environment, are from soil samples. So soil samples are something like uh, commons. <laughs> Uh, property and why not finding the antibiotics in this crowdsourced manner. And with my students we were trying to work on the design aspect of such project. How would we uh, create almost something like a game of people comparing the strength of these uh, actinomycetes or some other bacteria that have antibiotic properties? How would we in some sense gamify the experience? We were also thinking about some mobile applications. And um, interestingly, project moved. This is the BioStrike on GitHub that my students were working on. So they just created some mock-ups and some ideas of even financing that type of um, research. But it also moved into, it, it, it moves back and forth between Europe, Asia, and some other countries. So right now, there is another group on BioCommons that is kind of forking this project. And they're also thinking a lot about how to invest in that project. It's, it's interesting because they decided to be that pharma model by uh, creating some more decentralized solution which will even involve uh, uh, bitcoins. They called it biocoins. And so they even designed a special currency that will support this type of research. So in case you want to see something really crazy out there about licenses and this interaction between citizen science and research, look at the BioStrike project, which is still going on. And um, since I'm a philosopher, I do have some 
deep blah blah about the whole topic. I'm personally actually more interested in doing it in doing these projects right now. So maybe I will finish with this. I believe these hacker spaces, maker spaces, this type of activities actually define a new model of how technology and society interact, where technology is both object and instrument of governance. While under these, let's say, previous paradigms where technology is either object of um, governance or it's an instrument of governance in case of biopolitics, it, it's problematic. I believe uh, the hacker spaces or, or, or these more alternative engagements with R&D offer a bit of more deliberative model of how to do it. Um, so yes, making hacking for me is a form of experimental policy, basically. I call it a DIY micro-governance in these fab labs and so on, because you have like tentative collectives that are developed around these prototypes. So people test the prototype, they check how comfortable they feel or, or don't feel about that prototype, so they work on the design at the same time as they're trying to define what type of community they're building. So this is what I like about it, and for me it is a form of experimental policy. And that's the last one, and thank you. Uh, <coughs> Muito bom dia a todos. Uh, primeiro, eu gostaria de agradecer os organizadores da conferência. É muito importante, as pessoas muito interessantes. Interessante. E uh, tudo é fácil para nós que estamos participando, então agradeço muito. E segundo, eu vou pedir desculpas das pessoas, porque eu vou depois, agora, falar em inglês, ok? <laughs> But, uh, oh. Mais perto? Tá. Eu não posso ficar assim, <laughs> eu vou para lá, para cá. Não, tranquilo. Uh, You know, a, a, a colleague at MIT, Marvin Minsky, likes to say that, uh, no, no, é pior ainda, porque eu falo com o mouse, então cada três palavras está perdido. A colleague, Marvin Minsky, likes to say he never plans his talks, because if he does, then he never learns anything. Uh, I'm not Marvin, Marvin's an amazing person, and, uh, but... Listening to the talks up till now keeps making me, okay, I've got to change this, got to think that. So that's a good thing. So there's going to be a lot of Viajan doing it <laughs> during the presentation. But I'm going to come from somewhat of a different perspective. Not necessarily perspective but in terms of point of view, but perspective in terms of the ideas around participatory, do-it-yourself, and especially the role of education. Actually, education is a word that from Seymour Papert, we hardly ever use anymore. Because education is something that you do to someone else. You educate them. And we think much more on the learning side. Because learning is something that we do. And so it's like thinking instead of education, which is what we're going to present to somebody, it's like as a person learns what they develop. And how do we, how do we support this in much better ways? And particularly as more uh, access tools, technologies, ideas are open and accessible to everybody, which is really something that's extremely recent, what this potentially enables. So not thinking so much about, let's say, science at the top end and discovering new knowledge, but developing scientific knowledge and developing scientific thinking bottom up and participatory. So, okay. I'm going to just go through one case in particular. There's no way to Uh, uh, even if I plan better. There's no way to really get everything there. So I'm, I'm trying to just use one case as something as, you know, Levi-Strauss would call an object to think with to raise some of the issues. So this is uh, north-central Thailand. Uh, and in, historically, in, there's been a huge problem with the burning of forest and clearing of forest for farmland. The majority of this happens you know, much more by big companies, not so much by small villages, but the small villages do it too, and they've historically done it. And when it's one small village in a small piece of land, it's not so bad in some sense. You know, they do need to eat. They do need to create space for agriculture. And you see, going the other direction, it's really hilly. It's not exactly the easiest place to farm everything that you need. So they burn. They burn to chase the animals. They burn to clear land. And they burn 
actually, one part where none of us at the beginning knew the answer to this, they swear that there's a kind of fungus, a root that grows after you burn that's one of the most, their best delicacies, and they love this, and they said, if we stop burning the forest, will this still grow? And actually, we, we had not a clue. But, uh, but if you think about this on a scale of one village, it's not so bad. On scale of tens of thousands of villages, it's a huge global problem, especially over time. Burning the forest is illegal in Thailand. Deforestation is illegal. It doesn't stop it from happening, partly because of corruption, also partly because it's what people do, right? They think, no, it's for us. They don't feel, for the most part, the government serves their interest. And so they'll do things. And you see this when we did a project with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. You were told you can't trust any of the data that flows up. How many cows do you have? What is there? You can't trust this data. Why? Because people don't trust the government to give an honest answer. If I say, oh, I have this many, maybe I'm going to get taxed more. If I say I have fewer. So it, there's all the kind of game theory that's going on in practice that's there. And actually, this part of it, though, is, is you know, something that's often left out of the discussion. As we worked more in the rural areas, we learned that like, there is deep scientific knowledge in a certain way. There was an understanding of game theory, although nobody would call it game theory. But it was done in practice. It was very pragmatic. You, you, you know, it's, it's uh, kind of ironic to hear the term do-it-yourself as applied back to the rural areas. And I love the presentation, but rural areas, by definition, are do-it-yourself because you, if something breaks, you can't call, you know, you don't have electricity, not until recent years. And so you, you can't just call the electrician if something breaks. You're doing it, you're forming it. One of the first places in an indigenous or a hill tribe area in Thailand where we worked, there was no electricity and there was no need, and so we had a computer lab that was set up it's almost 20 years ago. But there was no electricity, so village, everyone got together and put it in. And of course, people, they did it before we got there, didn't quite know. And the first day they turned everything on, they blew up the transformer. You know, so this kind of, oh, one of my students from Brazil had a project in one of the favelas in, in Sao Paulo, uh, Heliopolis, and it's the largest one, right? And so uh, they did these projects, and nobody was paying for electricity there. Everybody is like, just, you know, what, what's it called? Gachiando? You know, as coys is until words are going to come from any language. Just be ready. <laughs> uh, you know, and that they, uh, you know, so that's how they got the electricity. As they worked on projects, one of the first things they did was create Journal de Scola. This student loved making video. Students really adapted. Students were very familiar with television. And really quickly, because of the tools available, they made pretty sophisticated stuff. So the first Journal de Scola of this, in this favela was how to steal electricity safely, OK? Because <laughs> they had a fire and three houses burned down right before. So OK, totally off topic, right? All right, so they burn. And what happens? We all know this, right? So in this part of Thailand, you get most of the rain during monsoon season, four months out of the year. It's shortening. It's coming later. They're, they were experiencing, you know, climate change. And it's really impactful on them. When in, in Thailand, I don't mean to overemphasize that in particular, because this phenomenon is more global. You're a poor, you know, low-income farmer. You have your bit of land. You know, one of the first project in this village, what they called the debt project. 83 families in this village, right? Every family was in debt. So that was the first project. We, we, we adopted ideas from Paulo Freire to work there. Say, okay, you know, you talk to people there, you, they tell you, you talk to people in the ministry, they say, oh, rural education, it's terrible. The families don't care. The students don't care to learn. They don't show up in school. The teachers are terrible. You go to the rural area, they say, school doesn't teach us what we need. You know, you talk to the teachers, and it's never been my experience that we've had resistance from teachers when you work with the teachers in a collaborative way. Never been my experience that, oh, they're going to try and stop the project, make it bad. Like all of us, they don't like being treated as the object of someone else's research or some government's program. And they do have a tremendous amount of local knowledge. So when they're, it's participatory in terms of what to do, we don't have that resistance. So, the, uh, you know, of the brilliant ideas from Paulo Freire, one of them is that make the, your environment your curriculum, entering into a conversation with this curriculum. 
This was the way, you know, it gets turned on its head in school where now people think of Paulo, <laughs> Paulo Freire as more thing of how we learn to read. But that wasn't the key point for Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire was much more the development of critical consciousness, really the, the empowerment and the liberation that comes from working in this kind of way, for gaining back control in your there. Where reading and writing were a powerful tool to enable this. So that was a tool. Now that we were introducing much more technologies, the technology beyond pen and paper, well, this conversation that you enter in your environment becomes much more powerful still. So, uh, you know, so we just said, we're, make this the basis. The, the, every family in debt was the biggest thing on everybody's mind. So what did the students do? They went through every household, they started to keep accounts, they looked at it in the rural area, what happens? You have income only when you have cultiv uh, when you have the you know, uh, I, can't, I don't have the word in English. Uh, 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 you know, when you harvest your crops and then you sell them. So you have income actually very small part of the year. The beginning of the year, you're in debt. Actually, it was a nice thing. I hate Excel, but uh, one of the things that they did first that they wanted to do was to graph it out. And you see your income is just diving in the red until you have something and then it comes back up. In the first year I was working there, you know, you, you work in, in another part of the country, everything is based on rice, and you ask them how did it go. So during the rice season, four months, you couldn't really work with them because they're working all the time. So, but the other time you had chance. And so you said, well, how did it go this year? They said, oh, it was terrible. Well, what happened? Uh, we didn't have enough rain. We didn't have, get enough rice. Everybody lost money. Next year, come back. I don't know why. I asked it this way. I said, like, how was it this year? They said, oh, we had a lot of rain. I said, how was the rain this year? They said, lots of rain. Oh, so that's good. Yeah, so how much rice? Oh, lots of rice. Oh, so that's good, right? No, too much rice, price went down, we all lost money, okay? And, and so this is where you're hitting, you know, these kind of things so that, uh, you know, there's social forces that are powerful that they're having to hit. Hitting them with more knowledge and being more self-sufficient is huge. In this part of Thailand where it's the rainy time, so they're on the hillside, rains come, it's torrential, you have flooding, you lose the topsoil, you lose the most fertile soil, the floods can endanger the village, it's tough. During the dry season, here's the other side, okay, is that things aren't growing, you don't have enough water, there isn't infrastructure. After the debt project and some smaller projects, uh, including making computer games, uh, uh, the, they, they attacked what's the health of the forest and should we keep burning? And this became the study of everybody. And so you say, well, how do you understand and how do they understand what's the health of the forest? And there was a minister of environment from Columbia who used to say the best thing you can do for environment is educate everybody because it's everybody's participation that makes not only the political force to make certain things acceptable or unacceptable, but it's also individual actions in aggregate make a huge difference. And so, and including for us, right? And so this became the object. This is actually a few years into the study. And this has been the study in this village now for about 12 years is what's the health of the forest. In the beginning, what was amazing about this village in particular is everything was still pretty much consensus based on how they're deciding and what they're doing. They got access early in the project and really early for Thailand because access in rural areas is really only recent and they got huge bandwidth two years ago. But uh, you know, when we first started 97 and this is around 2001 when they were really going deeply into this project, it's really bad connectivity. But things became available. But things became available in ways that were unusable for the residents there. So it, it was a way that, yeah, you could find scientific data. You could get access to university or research papers in Thai. You could do it, but it wasn't part of their way of learning, doing, acting. And so even though it was available in a very slow way, it wasn't still useful. On the other hand, hands-on, deep investigation, research into the questions that most interested them, which for a long period of time are very much based on subsistence, their environment, etc. it goes. And so it was great to come up with such an open question. And it's kind of a, it's citizen science in a way, but it's, a different, it's not with a goal of let's find something new that we didn't do by having large-scale participation by citizens, but it's really a focused kind of communal group that's not discovering something new necessarily for the world, but new very definitely for those participants. 
And this is critical. And how do you do that? And how do you validate it? Where, what, as we got access, it became really clear access to expertise on the issues that they face in a way that they are not disenfranchised from the process is incredibly rich. So that they're driving the research process themselves. So the person from the government that worked with me when I was there for you know, over three years, he's really the one that got this project going. And I asked them as they're deciding something, and they're making a decision that you know it's not the right thing to do, what do you do? And he says, I, you know, if, if they ask me, I'll say what I think. I'll say my opinion. But the decision's theirs. I can't say, oh, this is scientific knowledge. This is what you have to do. Because it's really still through this learning process. And for all of us, we think as researchers, you know, uh, we spend all of our life wrong, right? We're always wrong until we finish a problem where we think we have the right answer, and then we move on to another project where we're wrong again. Because once we're right, we, we, you know, it's not research anymore. We've got to do something else. And so it, it's that way for them, too. So it's like thinking about this way. So when you think of what's the health of the forest, how do you think about all these things that are there? Really essential that they have, you know, as we'll call local knowledge, about you know, systemic things about, you know, which plants work with which ones. Old knowledge, one of the first projects that they did was collecting the traditional knowledge about herbal medicine from the elders in the village, as well as how to cast uh, uh, curses on the people. They, they learned that. I stayed on the good side of everybody, so. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, but when you say, well, what's the health of the forest, what do you measure? How do you know? What are you looking for? And so this gets going. So, you know, obviously there's certain things you're doing. Uh, this beautiful little device, uh, you see the battery there, it's going to be solar, it is solar powered, and they you know, use it to hook up, they distribute them through there. Uh, you know, and so in this space they're measuring during the time of the dry time, how many leaves are falling, you know, in, in which spaces. So they have some places where they construct, I'm going out of order, sorry. These, which are called in Thailand, check dams. So you see, it's all local materials, some rocks, some bamboo, some other wood, and some cement. And this is what they're doing. So it's the idea is that as the rain is falling, as it's flowing down the hills, it has its paths historically. You build these little check dams along the way on down, creates little pools of water so it doesn't all just rush down, doesn't wash so, so many things out. The trees and other things should have more water during time. And... Uh, and, 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 you know, and then the idea is that, well, it should retain more water, it should be better. And it's a really beautiful idea, but the idea wasn't invented there. This is an idea that they really got from one of the ministry people, that it's a really nice idea for the kind of things that you can do. They observed it in a different place. So the, to find this idea and to then be able to visit and have that took human appropriation. It, it took human participation. It didn't just self-combust. Lots of ideas do really self-combust, it's, it's inspiring, but this is there. Now, one of the ways we wanted to use computers was like modeling things. First place I worked, you know, same kind of thing, they only have water part of the year, then they try to create a dam to create a reservoir by having a reservoir, you know, then they say, okay, we can grow extra crops, not during the rainy season, you know, and they went through, so the mathematics they learned through doing this, right, in just, you know, a couple of weeks. They got a lot of the mathematics that we'll throw at them in school in an abstract way that nobody retains because it's about, you know, uh, you know Joao has this, you know, you know, a farm, it's got this much space, what's the area? But they figured all these things out because they really needed it. And then by bringing, and it's like there was lots of scientific knowledge but was, was not as present was how do you formalize this? How do you really start to take symbolic? How do you abstract out? How do you take these abstractions and apply them to those situations? What do they do? What don't they do? What's different? How do you account for that? How do you build models? How do you think through? How do you have a hypothesis? How do you test it? Focusing on those problems was great. And this was where, the, for us, the role of the computer was essential. Okay, because it was in this way that you're able to try a idea, test it, try it, test it, try it, test it, calculate it, do all these kind of things. So computers were essential. When we started in 97, computers were unbelievably expensive. Computers are still unbelievably expensive, so this is foreshadowing something I'm getting to. But it wasn't really feasible at that point to do these things. But what these are is what a mathematician would call an existence proof of what becomes possible. Now, in the... Uh, uh, to finish the one modeling story, 
they always tried to build a dam. It never worked. The government tried. It never worked. And the students in the first day discovered why it wasn't working is that, well, they had one water pump. You know, they were building where it would be the cheapest to build the dam because there was already an embankment for a road. So they built it there, but the water pump was two kilometers away. And it never really functioned, right? The water would seep out. So they started to design potential models to think about how do they redesign the farmland because certain parts would be flooded. How do they redistribute it equitably? How do they, you know, how much would they need if they grow this? How much water do they need? How much is usually falling? This came out within days, okay? And, and it was really astounding. Here, they told me they didn't do it that way. And so they first built the, you see there's a lot of stones. Stones are big. Stones are not at the top of the mountain, they're at the bottom, right? They're carrying them up. So where do they build the first check dams? At the bottom, what happens? Rain comes down, it's flowing pretty fast by the time it's getting to the bottom. And in the first year, none of the check dams held. <laughs> so they, but they learned something quite important about some fluid dynamics. Okay. Uh, all right, just to not run out of time totally, that's what it looks like. And this is the reservoir that they created. It's astounding. And each year they add on to this project. So first year, well, first year broken check dams. Second year reservoirs. Ongoing scientific research about what they have to look at each year. Fourth year, uh, then they start to irrigate the field. Next year, they start to think about how do we purify the water to, to do. Sixth year went to organic farming. Okay. Seventh year was generate their own electricity. It's, it's amazing. You know, they call themselves the village that learns. Well, they call it in Thai, and I don't know how to pronounce it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. What's also amazing, right? Every family was in debt. Now every family out of debt. They got some help from the Thai uh, Farmers Bank because once they rationalized what they were doing, the bank forgave a lot of debts or gave a loan so that they could get the debts because... As in every product, even the loans, they were being highly exploited. The loans available to them were the worst loans available because they couldn't get them from banks. That changed. So, so lots of things happened, but it's amazing. But what was most amazing to me, as successful as this is, it didn't just spread organically. You would think, I ask, why don't your neighboring villages, they give. They don't sell. They're really, uh, they don't sell, we'll sell you the bottled water, or we'll sell you electricity. Right? They donate because they say it's like you should be doing what we're doing, and it doesn't exactly spread. So of the hugest challenges, uh, Seymour Papert, who was my thesis advisor, inspired me so much, approached life as a mathematician, which he is. And uh, in the beginning of the work, it was kind of the idea of mathematics. Mathematicians, to me, are some of the most generous people around, right? Because why? I may not believe something. You may show a proof for something that is totally opposite of what I believe. Your proof, it's validated. I accept it, right? That's, and, and we keep building from that. I rechange my framework. That doesn't happen in lots of walks of life, right? And uh, so, you know, we went into a lot of projects thinking, just show it, just do it. People copy it. And it doesn't happen because there's other cultural factors that really interfere with power, with not with ongoing, let's say, customs and cultures. So deep thinking about, yeah, we have to make infrastructure available. We have to make things as open and accessible in an equitable way. But even still, it's, it's necessary but not, not sufficient in most cases, right? Not always. Certain things are highly appropriable. If you look at, like, spread of telecenters through things or, you know, certain kind of, uh, you know, with cell phones spreading throughout all, all the world, you find anybody, you know, lots of people that do amazing repairs of this stuff. And so this is, again, you see things that really grew. When I did my thesis, one of the things I noticed is that was we were working with a lot of these young adults, adolescents in, these, in the village areas. They were incredible engineers. They jumped into the projects. They could debug. They could do it. They weren't daunted. They were really good in a way that you'd say, based on if you were accepting them for a college program, you wouldn't accept them based on the record. But boy, they outperformed a lot of the people that graduated with degrees in technology. And one of the things we saw was that they hacked engines like crazy, right? So you'd see these little Kubota diesel motors cost about $100 in Thailand, used for everything. A one-person tractor, this is one that's now hooked up, it's pumping the water, they have built the ditch, it, it, then you see the hose, so it's like how they irrigate, it runs the rice mill. I went to this one place where they had, you know, they didn't have electricity, but they had an amazing rice mill 
that they built out of, you know, whatever was nearby. It looked like Lego, right? It was really open. You could really see it. It wasn't black boxed because, you know, you had to see how did this work. And it was brilliant. Even the design of the barn that it was in was brilliant because the ambient wind came from the direction enough so that as you start to grind the husk, it would go off. So they had this experience of hacking. You know, and so one of my colleagues, when we were first putting fab labs into some of these places, Thailand, Ghana, and some of the places, it was really a lack of familiarity on our part because they were already doing a lot of the things we had with the fab lab, and so the cost was so much higher than what we needed to do. This was a project, this is in the Pantanal, it's pretty interesting, where it was like looking at like uses of water and how do they do it, talking to people. Uh, this is... It, 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 you know, they would say the river level is about one-third of where it was. Most of the families make money by fishing. Fishing is way down. So they started to look at water capture, and actually what they found was one of the best sources nearby was where there was a swimming pool that got drained every month. And how would you recapture, repurpose that water for use for fish farming? Uh, this is also the same place in Pantanal where the biggest problem that the students faced was the classroom was too hot. And so you say, if you only have a few fans, what's the... What's the optimal placement of fans to cool everybody down in a classroom? It's not a bad physics problem, right? I mean, physics engineering, right? It's really pretty good. They looked at us and said, well, you all, you know, grad students, professors, you know how to do this, right? And we're all like, beats the hell out of me. But that was the best part of it was that it, we get a school view that to be intelligent means you know the answer right away. And it shifted to be you'll find a way to figure out the answer. So this part really leveraged into the culture of being able to do this. Uh, they kept bees there, so even as we got data, as we did things, temperature readings, humidity readings, graph it out, nobody felt it, right? Because it was still kind of abstract, because people were still kind of used to working in this way. So to make it more visual, we used the smoke they used to chase the bees out of the beehive to film it and visualize what's happening with the airflow. All right, so it was spectacular. Downside was that the smoke stayed in the classroom for two weeks. But uh, <laughs> this is in a school in the periphery of Sao Paulo. These were students who, at this point, it's really interesting. I visited their teacher a couple months ago. So this is 2002. And, uh, you know, so uh, we have a little board there that, you know, just it was open hardware. One of the students designed it. It's, it's really pretty nice, lots of cheap sensors, using Sukata, which we started actually with the project in Heliopolis because bringing in expensive materials was daunting to people. They were afraid to break it. When we brought in, they said, bring in anything that's broken. It was great, not only because it lessened the price of everything, but all these familiar objects to people in Sao Paulo, you know, a tape recorder, a fan, a scale, you know, whatever, uh, nobody really understood the mechanism. And by taking it apart and repurposing the mechanism, that's, you know, it was just incredible. Well, this was their intelligent bus, which is really quite amazing. Uh, it's a longer story. It's written up in other places. And this is work on using balance and, you know, uh, your body and understanding balance by outfitting things in order to really start to understand uh, you know, how would you do control? How do you do balance? And just, you know, middle school students. This is, so what it led to is that we always had great results using computation in a creative, constructive, participatory way um, to do it. So long as the price of computers uh, was so high, it was out of the hands of people. Even in the U.S. at this point, you know, so let's say early two, well, Papert was talking about this since 1970. If you think about this, Papert was designing and working for every student programming computers and the importance for learning in the 60s is when it first started working on this. Computers in the 60s were mainframes, cost millions of dollars, would use up more space than this, needed so much air conditioning, they have their own personal ozone hole. So they, you know, but this was the idea. Even still, when we try to do things in the U.S., they say we don't have enough computers to really change how we do math and science learning. You have a computer lab, but it's not used for that. So it was just stuck. So forever we were arguing with industry, create a low-cost computer, open, cheap, durable, for children, for learning, everywhere. And never, 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 never. So at some point we said, we'll do it ourselves. And we screwed it up really badly. But what we didn't screw up badly is, is it was the idea and that made it possible that really these kind of, th there's no reason why a computer needs to cost so much. There's no reason why 
uh, you know, a computer needs to break in three years. There's no reason why we need to think a computer is obsolete in a couple years. It's ridiculous, right? It's a deception of industry. And it's only fought by people putting out things and doing things in other ways. The idea that was brought up yesterday in terms of, you know, uh, patrocinadores. <laughs> <laughs> What's the word in English? But uh, pa <laughs> patrons, <laughs> same word, of course. You know, so it, it, it's essential, right? Somehow we have to convince this has to be there. As one laptop per child on its own, I left five years ago, but uh, it's become more of just a kind of hardware company is basically dying. You're going to see, you know, what got introduced as netbooks. We're just taking as much power out of the computer, put it in a low price to get you to move back up. When there's not pressure to keep the prices down, we can't just trust that they're going to just go back up. So we had these kind of projects. You know, you have these kind of boards that are easy to design. The one in the middle, on the right, obviously, you know, is Arduino. But in the middle is one my student did, and we made a design for every co What components can you buy in which country? Here's how you make your own board in order to be able to do it. Open software, making sensors. We took teachers in Sao Paulo to Santa Eugenia Street, right, where the electronic stores are. And they were scared to death, right? And we said, come on, we're making our own sensors, we're building our own boards. And they did it. And once they did it, they felt really great. And the students working on these projects and the people in these villages, they really feel good. They know they've accomplished something that's really difficult. They know they impacted their lives. You see students who were terrible in a traditional setting, when it becomes shifted more towards hacking, doing, constructing, they become amazing students. You get this mixture of cultures of people with familiarity for what we believe in, how you practice science, what you think about in terms of programming and uh, 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 building abstractions and create, defining ideas symbolically and how you test things out. Merging these things and the problems that people have, you know, it's essential. So what we tried to do, we got started, but it didn't keep going. You go in Rwanda and their textbooks, if they have any, you know, come from, you know, France and Belgium who colonized them, right? So you talk to the minister, he says, yeah, I know all about the rivers in Belgium. <laughs> I don't know anything, but the, the ecosystem in Rwanda is incredibly rich. It's amazing, right? Where it's the so part of the source of the Nile Basin, part of the source of the Congo Basin. This became the study. Not that they were necessarily you know, making a new discovery, but for them, these were new discoveries. And so it became the idea, if you have, so this we started about seven years ago, but if you have tons of devices, lots of sensors, how do we make the study of our environment really valid? And someone from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences was talking about, as they think about hurricanes that affect the U.S., you know, they think, oh, they form off the coast of West Africa. But actually, as you start, but there's no data gathering. They actually think, no, it's probably further into the Sahara. You may find that it's really global. But there was no way to measure this. So not so much for hurricanes for the U.S., but very much for their own use, this became the study. So this is what the idea of trying to do what I've been calling massively open online projects, as opposed to courses. Talk about zombie ideas. One of the worst is that we're going to video courses and do them online, and boy, that's going to solve education. Forget it, right? We already know that's a dead idea, and now it's going to die again and eat some more brains in the process. So, but by doing it as projects, you know, no, you have a way that really it's powerful and it works. So this is the website which we're about to fix for uh, Universidade Federal Sul do Bahia where lots of these ideas are going into place. Every student will get a computer. We're bringing connectivity to areas that never had that. And there will be th generative themes that will be projects for large groups of university and small groups on studying water in South of Bahia, how do you, you know, work around dengue, uh, public health results. So lots of these ideas are going in with the group there. They're not just coming from me. They had these already. And so I Really would love to see people join, participate, offer your expertise, give advice, and so on. So thank you very much for your time. Sorry to run a little over. Thank you. Uh, I'm also going to thank all the organizers. Um, everyone else has thanked everybody by name, so I'm not going to do it again. But this really is a, a, an impressive group of people and an impressive job of organization. So. I want to thank the university and everyone else involved. I'm going to try and stay within the time. 
<laughs> I, uh, I even have my watch. Um, I feel humbled by the other people that have spoken. Um, by a set of circumstances, which I will describe, I unwittingly became the face of biohacking at some point because I was asked to give a TED talk and a lot of people watch those talks, I found out. So it kind of embarrasses me because I didn't invent it. Um, I'm not really, I, I think some of you guys are much more on the cutting edge, uh, David and Denisa, than, than I am in terms of um, real hacking. But for me, I came from a very traditional scientific background. I was educated at Columbia University, New York University. I have a PhD in molecular biology. And I had a very uh, kind of boring career in biomedical research for many, many years, working for a lot of biotech startups, a pharmaceutical company. And I fell into this in a, in a very backwards way. Uh, I was sitting at my nice desk in my office reading a local newspaper and it had a weird news column <laughs> and it said something about people who were trying to put laboratories in their closets and making yogurt that glowed green and they called themselves DIY bio and I thought well this is really great um, we're going through a period in America where people don't respect science the way they did. They're not interested the way they did when I was growing up. And wouldn't it be great if this was a sign that people were getting more interested in science? And um, maybe I should support this in some way. Maybe uh, very condescending of me in retrospect. But maybe I can kind of shepherd them and make sure they don't kill themselves and help them out with some knowledge. So uh, I started following this Google group, which was created by Mackenzie Cowell and Jason Bobe, both of whom had been involved in a competition called iGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, which uh, several Brazilian teams enter every year. It's an undergraduate synthetic biology competition, and a lot of the people that did the competition thought, well, gee, why can't we continue to do this sort of very safe but very interesting work when, when we leave school? So uh, I lurked on the group for a while, and there were people saying, is anyone starting a DIY group in New York? And I typed in, well, if you want to start a group, let's all meet. So that was the first meeting of what was to become my organization. We called ourselves DIY Bio NYC in the beginning. And now, that was in 2009. And now we have gotten a tremendous amount of press coverage. And everyone seems to want to know what we're doing next, which is very scary. <laughs> But that's, you know, how I got from my desk at work to here. So I want to tell you a little bit more about what GenSpace, which is what we finally ended up naming the organization, is about and the sorts of things that we do and a peek into GenSpace. The, this talk is very local as opposed to the global talks that you've heard. Um, we've tried to do some stuff in other countries, but uh, nothing anywhere near what uh, the rest of you have done. So um, bear in mind, I'm learning. I'm here. I consider this an incredible learning experience. And hopefully, we'll be able to do some of the sort of things that you guys do in the future. So when we first started GenSpace, uh, it was well accepted that citizens could participate in certain types of science. I think astronomy is probably the science that everyone is most familiar with. People are always naming comets after amateurs who discovered them. But somehow, uh, the idea of an amateur with their hands on a plate full of bacteria was very scary. And at the time when we started GenSpace, the media was not very kind. 
they had articles about Frankenstein in the basement and uh, Jurassic Park and all that kind of stuff. So it, it was kind of a risk on our part to go out in public at all and talk about what we were doing. And a lot of the discussions were originally about how do we make this not scary for the general public? How do we convince people that we're doing this for a positive purpose and not a negative purpose? Because when you democratize technology, it's always scary. Uh, people say, what, what do you mean? You, you let anybody into the lab? <laughs> and I say, yes. Uh, you know, we do have some supervision, but basically anyone is allowed to come in and do molecular biology. So I want to play this video. This, bear in mind, this was probably, this was the first class that I taught, so I refused to go on camera. And my friend and co-founder, Dan Grushkin, who is a science journalist, had convinced his friend at Nature Medicine to come and do this video. So Dan is the one who ended up talking not me. But you'll sort of see the diversity. There's a diversity of people uh, as we go through the slides, but also just kind of how we were framed in the beginning. And a lot of what we became was shaped by the press telling us what we were doing. It, it was kind of weird. And we go, oh, okay, gee, that sounds like fun. Maybe we should do that. So bear with me. I'm going to try and play this video, hopefully it all goes well. Want to be a molecular biologist? Well, you can be at the world's first community laboratory. It works a lot like a gym. Uh, the idea is that you come whenever you'd like and you just you pay dues like you would in a gym. Using mostly donated equipment and found materials, a small group of biology enthusiasts recently created this lab at a warehouse in Brooklyn, New York. We built the lab right on this big open space. It's, it's a big glass cube. All the materials that we've made it out of are found materials. So glass doors, uh, windows that were salvaged and repurposed. But why would people want to run lab experiments in their spare time? It is attractive to people who have ideas that aren't necessarily useful, but they're certainly fun. One of the first projects being developed by the Gen Space team is a device that will be launched by helium balloons 30 kilometers into the Earth's stratosphere in search of remote signs of life. The High Altitude Microbial Sampling Station, or HAMS for short, uh, is a weather balloon that's going to be lofted up to about 100,000 feet into the stratosphere capture microbes, hopefully, bring them down uh, in a sterile uh, package, in a, in a sealed package, and then have them analyzed. So far, the garage biotechnologists have just built a prototype of their microbe catcher, but they hope to launch the real deal later this year. Genspace is much more than just a laboratory for do-it-yourselfers. It also provides hands-on educational courses for people to come and learn. It's not just scientists who are working in the lab. It's people who are bringing their own curiosity about the world um, and bringing it to our lab and exploring. The Genspace founders see themselves on the vanguard of a new movement of DIY biology. So Genspace is the first community bio lab, but it certainly won't be the last. I, I get the sense that there'll be a lot more labs popping up all over the country and all over the world. And they think labs like Genspace could revolutionize the study of biology. Now that we've reached a certain level of, of knowledge in the information age, we've come to, the, you know, it's open space for another age, and I think that age will be the biological age. And I think, you know, the next great PC computer or Apple computer won't be a computer at all. It'll be this amazing uh, bacteria that has this amazing application that everyone's going to want to have. I don't know what it is yet. If I knew, I'd be, I wouldn't be talking to you here. <laughs> For Nature Medicine, I'm Ailey Dolgan. So uh, I think it wasn't surprising that I was second guessing what I was doing in this crazy environment. But uh, 
uh, during the economic downturn in, in around 2009, they started cutting the programs and I ended up being laid off and I was having so much fun with GenSpace that I decided to do it full time. So I think this is, these are the three forces that came together um, to form the DIY bio movement. There's the maker movement, uh, the fact that DNA became cheaper to read and write, and a lot of used equipment got dumped on eBay. And also the rise of the field of synthetic biology where you perform genetic engineering uh, using more of an engineering discipline. Pieces of DNA become standardized parts that have specifications and that allows people that may not have uh, a deep background in biology to put together biological circuits that actually work. And this is, this is a concept that's still being tried. Um, what really helps is that there are high throughput systems that have now been invented. So if you can modularize the DNA, you can mix and match and build a number of constructs simultaneously and test them. Whereas uh, in traditional labs, the way I was taught, you make a construct and then you tweak it uh, then you make it again, and it's a very linear, long process, uh, almost like uh, artisan bread, <laughs> rather than a high throughput engineering problem. And this, by the way, this field is going to revolutionize biology, because there are places like the Broad Institute at MIT where they can design, build, and test hundreds of constructs simultaneously. And they're going after really big questions like um, nitrogen fixation pathways. Can we put them into cereal crops? So it's a very exciting time to be involved in the sciences. And because you can do genetic engineering on a small scale relatively easily and cheaply, it, it's exciting another generation of young scientists and amateurs. Uh, this is how most DIY bio groups start. This is us in um, Dan's kitchen with plastic covering everything. And we just sent out a call and random people showed up and we were, we were doing something called gel electrophoresis, which is not a particularly new technology, but it's a foundational technology for genetic engineering. It's a way of analyzing DNA and it's very visual. And one of my big wake up calls uh, in terms of the general public and science was to see that something that I did on a routine basis and I thought was rather boring, uh, everyone gathered around the electrophoresis box and started taking pictures of it as if it was you know, something really, really interesting. And I thought, well, gee, this is kind of nice. Uh, I guess I do kind of cool stuff for a living. And um, it, being involved in this actually reawakened my love of science because you can get quite jaded if you're working within either a university or a corporate environment and uh, you're always chasing funding. Um, what you do depends on where you can get the funding. If you work for a university and you're writing grants, there everyone knows there are certain topics that are hot and if you jump on the bandwagon, you know, you do a microbiome study these days, maybe you can get some money. And what you really want to do may not be that fundable. Or if you work for a company, what you do has to make money for their bottom line eventually. But I think most of us went into science because we liked the idea of experimenting and playing. And actually, if you talk to traditional scientists and say, well, I have a lab where you can do whatever you want as long as it's safe, you have to self-fund, but the infrastructure is there. We've got equipment, we have some shared supplies and reagents, and uh, you can do something that doesn't have to make money, it doesn't have to save the world, it doesn't even have to be new. It can be new to you, but not new to the world, which is a very important component. And I'm, I'm really fascinated by how that translates into field work. So this is a view of our messy area. The glass cube Dan was talking about 
the owner of the building built out of old sliding glass doors and windows. The lab benches are all old restaurant counters, so they're stainless steel, so they're cleanable, so that um, that satisfies biosafety level one requirements. And um, the exterior furniture, everything was, the, the building owner is sort of a collector of junk, and so nothing matches. So it has a really interesting aesthetic. Um, we get donated equipment all the time. Uh, that's actually in the corner, a DNA synthesizer, an old one. Um, you can tell by the Apple computer sitting on top of it with the floppy drive. But it works, and uh, it's mainly, it's not cost effective, but it's, it's a way of showing people, yes, you literally can print DNA, and this is how it's done. Here are the four vials. The bottles say G-A-T-C on them. And we have the basic equipment you would have in a molecular biology lab. We have PCR machines. We have um, a UV light box, electrophoresis equipment. Most of it was from my former company. When they downsized my lab, they wanted to sublet the space. And so they just wanted to get rid of the equipment as quickly as possible. Um, others we bought on eBay, others are donated. And uh, we do everything from very simple stuff, like this man is doing a DNA extraction, um, actually the adult version using um, a liquor called Bacardi 151, which is 151 proof alcohol, so it's sufficient for uh, precipitation of DNA. Um, this is a, a class in the lab showing off the results of their first bacterial transformation. We get about one-third uh, engineer computer science background, about one-third art design and architecture, which surprised me, and about one-third completely anything, um, a winemaker, a janitor, retired dentist, uh, students, uh, writers, um, people who have left science maybe for family reasons and are coming back and want to sharpen their skills. Uh, we opened the lab, we didn't know who was going to use it, and it continually surprises me what uses people have. So my innovation is only a space, a platform that's provided. And so uh, this is a group of people from Google that came and had a workshop. Uh, I didn't, I'm so out of it. I didn't realize um, until the end that the woman uh, sort of on the right crouching down is wearing Google glasses. <laughs> I didn't even know what they were. <laughs> and this is an artist who uh, was doing an interesting project where um, he's interested in DNA as uh, the gold standard for um, evidence in criminal trials, and he has a whole series of artworks based on DNA and electrophoresis, and his latest is he's, uh, as he put it, it used to be a photograph was good evidence, but now people can Photoshop photographs. What if people Photoshop DNA? So he's recreating the uh, blot from a famous criminal trial in the United States, um, the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, using his own DNA. That was his project. And this was a, a film that was a, a, a young man came in who was an art student and he said, I want to make cells turn different colors depending on what stage of the cell cycle they're in. And he wanted to start from scratch and I said, no, no. I'm sure someone has a plasmid out there that you can use that has different colored cytokines or something. And so we found one, but the amazing thing is he was an art student and we taught him tissue culture, he successfully transformed cell, and he talked somebody into letting him use a time-lapse microscopy platform. So it was pretty cool. This is an artist who did something really interesting. She, uh, she was fascinated by crime shows and she wanted to know how much information about a person you could find out from something they left behind, uh, a hair, a piece of chewing gum, a cigarette butt. 
And so she called her project Stranger Visions. More and more law enforcement agencies are interested in finding out appearance from DNA. So there are genetic markers that determine things like ethnicity, hair and eye color, whether or not you have freckles, um, what your body weight is likely to be. And so she took those markers, um, she made probes for them, and she took these samples randomly off the street, extracted DNA, and um, she came to our lab and we taught her how to do these things, but she was very independent. And she had this marvelous project where you started with a piece of chewing gum and you ended up with this 3D printed face. And the impact of that project was greater than any other project that was done in the lab, which really showed to me that this medium was much better at communicating. I'm always trying to tell people, you have to know about this DNA stuff because it's gonna touch every facet of your life if it hasn't already. You're already wearing genetically engineered cotton clothing. Your medicines are genetically engineered. Your doctor is going to be taking your entire DNA sequence soon when you come in. And you have to be ready for this world. So she, she shed light on a number of issues. First of all, how good DNA is getting at telling you things. Um, also privacy that somebody could just find something of yours and find out all this about you. And she didn't go anywhere near the biomedical markers, which are much more um, uh, 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 losing the word, but much they're, 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 uh, they're much more accurate. The, the, the appearance is not quite there yet. What she did was she wrote a program that took those characteristics, went out, and grabbed faces that had those characteristics, made a conglomerate, imported it into a 3D modeling program, and then tweaked it and then printed it. So these may not be entirely accurate, although she did do one from a producer of a television show that was frighteningly accurate. It could have been his son. It was amazing. Uh, also, students, there's never enough space for students. We try to accommodate as many student teams uh, as possible. This is a high school um, mentor and a couple of students. We go to iGEM. This is our iGEM team from 2011. Um, some more high school students from a local high school. We also try to engage um, with uh, random people off the street by having open nights. So I just got back actually from an expedition to Alaska where I have some property and we collect plant samples and we do a, a, something called DNA barcoding, which is a way of identifying species through DNA instead of by um, traditional taxonomy where you look at appearance. And we're doing this in cooperation with the New York Botanical Garden. So we have people ID the samples and then we we do barcoding and if the barcode isn't in the database yet then we've contributed something but it's mainly just to get people in the lab and they love to smash up the plants and extract the DNA. Um, this is interesting also in terms of uh, why you would want to, people say well why, what, what purpose is a lab? Why would you want a lab um, in your daily life. Well, the horse meat scandal in hamburger in Europe brought a lot of people into the labs because you can very easily test with barcoding whether or not the meat is horse meat or cow meat. Um, there are people that are interested in materials. Uh, a lot of designers and artists come in. This is um, a little mock-up of a chair made with uh, cellulose, bacterial cellulose, um, sort of leathery material that uh, we were trying to hack by um, putting different genes into the bacteria and trying to get a bacterial, uh, like a hybrid bacterial cellulose that had chitin in it to see if the properties would change. Uh, that's a project that's ongoing. Um, everybody loves turning bacteria green and red. That's sort of the hello world experiment. <laughs> um, People work with Arabidopsis, which is a plant model system. There was a guy who really wanted to make glow-in-the-dark bonsai trees. <laughs> but uh, 
people often, I'd say the biggest barrier is how long it takes to do something in biology and the fact that you have to wait for an organism to grow, which to someone from a computer science background is a shock because they're used to projects being uh, limited only by the amount of uh, coffee that they drink and hours they stay up. We've had uh, hackathons. We try to um, do stuff with people that are more in the hacking world. Uh, because our space happened to be started by people whose deep knowledge was in molecular biology and not programming, um, we're behind a lot of the other spaces in that sense. We didn't hack most of our equipment. We got it free or cheap, so we didn't need to. Um, I'm very interested in equipment hacks. We've got people that are doing them now at GenSpace. I've been trying to encourage it. We do a lot of um, street fairs and things in New York. This is we went to a local green market and had people extracting DNA from things. And just the fascination with actually seeing DNA physically as that cloudy clump of gunk and how gooey it is and snotty. Uh, this was a game uh, with paramecia, live paramecia on a slide with an iPhone and a camera that was capturing the movements and we were laying it on a game. That was kind of fun. Um, we do this bacterial painting exercise where kids draw something and then they trace over it and we bring the plates back to the lab and grow them and sent photographs back. Um, we do have some classes where we show people some common equipment hacks. We didn't invent any of these. That's me with the open PCR machine. Um, that's a really crappy gel box that I built. And of course, you can run it with batteries if you have to. And the Dremel Fuge is something that was from Cahal Garvey, who's an Irish biohacker who Pretty much everything in his lab, as you can see, is homemade. He uses a pressure cooker to uh, autoclave things. Um, he has a homemade incubator made out of a, a styrofoam and a light bulb and some kind of uh, probably uh, Arduino temperature sensing device. One of the things that we found is when we've gone to other places and tried to do workshops, it's very humbling because we thought we had this universal great exercise we could do, the strawberry DNA extraction. You get strawberries, you mash them up, and, and you put them through um, a coffee filter, and then you take that liquid and you add um, detergent and um, isopropanol, rubbing alcohol, which you can get in any drugstore in the United States. Well, we tried to do that in Cairo. First of all, they don't use coffee filters for most of their coffee. <laughs> You can't get alcohol anywhere in a Muslim country. <laughs> Isopropanol, ethanol, you can't get it. Um, you probably can get liquor underground, but uh, it, it's not high enough proof. And you can't find strawberries. So uh, we finally managed to do something, but it wasn't very good. And that was a humbling experience. So I would like to do more of that stuff and, again, fail most of the time, but uh, keep on going with this stuff. The most important thing, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up, I want to leave you with, it's very important for it not to be us versus them with science. It's got to be just us. And that, I think, is the most important things that these labs can do. Uh, I don't know if we would hope eventually we're going to publish research out of this lab. We hope that, um, we know that we've inspired a lot of students and given them hands-on experiences that they wouldn't get, even in a sophisticated country like the United States. The, the New York City public school system has no money. And most science teachers have no budget at all and no equipment. And they're teaching in conditions where science is not um, part of the metric. They are graded on math and reading scores, not on science. So their administration is negatively inclined to any extracurricular activities that involve something that doesn't
contribute to math and reading scores. So even if you approach them, it's generally through the teacher that you'll get some excitement and that teacher is taking a risk um, of potentially being disciplined for not focusing on what gets the school more money. So we wish we could accommodate more. And uh, all of these spaces, and there are a number of them in the United States and all over the world, are struggling with the proper economic model for the space. So right now, um, we fund our rent and our supplies through a uh, $100 a month membership fee, and we usually have anywhere from 12 to 20 working members, and then um, the income from the classes that we teach. But it's not enough to pay staff, so at some point we're going to have to either go out and get a grant or figure out some other way to do this. But um, it really scares me how negative uh, a lot of people think uh, towards genetic engineering. And I always say it's very difficult to be scared of it if you've done it in our lab, which is rather um, humble looking, not scary, beautiful, new, uh, and uh, very DIY looking. And if you've done it side by side with your kid. <laughs> so stand back. Let's get everybody to try science. Yeah. Inicialmente, eu gostaria de agradecer o, o convite a participar da, desse seminário e, de fato, assim, agradecer a, a super acolhida não é, que o, o pessoal do IBICT e do LINK proporcionaram para a gente. É muito é, reconfortante vir participar de uma atividade com todo o suporte para enfim, para ter mais energia disponível para a gente participar integralmente, não é? a UFRJ, a UniRio, é, enfim, muito obrigado e enfim, participar de uma mesa em que há uma, acho que uma grande possibilidade de diálogo entre as diferentes experiências. Né? Bom, gente, eu vou dividir a minha apresentação, uma primeira parte mais rápida que é situar um pouco, ah, quer dizer, como é que eu vim parar aqui nesse seminário, né? Então, acho que uma rápida introdução de como que eu, eu chego nessa temática da ciência aberta e em seguida, que acho que é uma parte mais que vai tomar a maior parte do tempo, que é falar um pouco sobre um, um momento exploratório de pesquisa que está, digamos, desenhando um, um, um novo projeto aí de, de investigação. É, aqui nesse slide eu coloquei um link uh, aqui embaixo onde Assim, praticamente tudo que eu estou falando aqui eu coloquei nesse pad, é, que é já, digamos, a versão 1.0 do que eu estou conversando aqui com vocês. E, então, sinto-se à vontade também, já na medida em que eu vou falando, se alguém quiser entrar nesse link, você pode editar diretamente aí na página. Tá? Os slides que eu vou apresentar é uma, é uma pequena seleção. Uh, são prints, né? porque eu não sabia se a internet ia estar disponível, e também se o servidor meu lá ia estar disponível. É, mas em cada um dos, dos temas que eu estou apresentando, né, ao invés do, do, do slide aqui, o que eu coloquei é um link uh, para a minha biblioteca de, de links. Então, ao invés de ver um slide, você entra lá e vai ter um, enfim, um conjunto bastante uh, enfim, significativo de experiências análogas àquelas que eu estou apresentando aqui. E se você quiser sugerir também outras coisas e tal, depois é só agregar e a gente já sai daqui com uma versão... 1.2, 1.3 aqui dessa apresentação. Tá? Bom, então, inicialmente, para situar a nossa experiência, é, eu estou na Universidade Federal de São Paulo, no campus do Bairro dos Pimentas, é um campus novo, criado em 2007, parte aí do processo de expansão das universidades federais, é, no Departamento de Ciências Sociais, e, mais diretamente, cuidando também da área da, da licenciatura dentro do curso, então, portanto, também da, da área de formação de professores. É a partir do, do, do contato né, com uma nova demanda institucional que praticamente acho que todas as coisas que eu estou fazendo agora são um pouco essa tentativa de responder a um caminho anterior de pesquisa e a ah, um encontro de uma nova demanda de questões que estão colocadas aí pela instituição. A partir daí, eu dei início à montagem de um, de um laboratório, né, que é, na verdade é mais um, um espaço de de trabalho colaborativo aí com os estudantes da graduação, que eu nomeio Pimenta Lab, pensando claramente aí no, no bairro. 
está muito alto. Ok. É, enfim, onde a gente desenvolve projetos de pesquisa e extensão, é, junto aos estudantes, é, projetos tanto no campo da educação, formação de professores para o ensino de sociologia na educação básica, e ações no campo mais da sociologia política e da sociologia da tecnologia, em projetos aí, juntamente a movimentos sociais, a, pensando né, também organizações sociais, projetos no campo da ação coletiva, é, tendo como tema aí questões sobre o acesso à informação. O comum, o transversal a todas essas iniciativas, é o objetivo de produzir práticas de pesquisa e ensino, que se efetivam de maneira uh, colaborativa, a partir de pesquisa, né, de pesquisação, é, fazendo uso de tecnologias da informação para a produção de conhecimento situado. Né? E aí estou pensando no conhecimento situado um pouco no, nos termos da dona Harry, né, situated knowledge. Uh, como um elemento pouco transversal a essas práticas. Né? Quer dizer, todas elas, em certo sentido, elas são uma resposta a, eu acho que a três vetores aí que, de alguma maneira, me atravessam nesse, nesse local. É, um é o interesse pelas formas renovadas de produção de conhecimento, as formas de uh, produção colaborativa, mediante o uso das tecnologias da informação. Um segundo vetor relacionado a pesquisas anteriores é o também a um engajamento uh, social junto a grupos de mediativismo, tecnoativismo, enfim, grupos que trabalham com a democratização da comunicação. E um terceiro vetor que era justamente uma inserção numa instituição universitária que estava vivendo um processo, ou está vivendo né, um processo de intensa transformação é, e que provoca aí inúmeras questões relativas à relação sociedade-universidade e as formas de produção de conhecimento científico. Não é? É, vindo, portanto, de um campo não é, de práticas no âmbito da cultura digital e também de ah, movimentos sociais que trabalham com o uso da tecnologia, de imediato foi, para mim, um grande, ah, não exatamente um choque, mas uma, uma certa... Uh, surpresa que, no âmbito da, da universidade e também junto aos alunos, muitas vezes da graduação, é, havia um, sentia um descompasso muito grande naquilo que eu vivenciava fora da universidade e aquilo que eu estava encontrando dentro. Não é? assim, havia uma, realmente uma, uma, pouco, uma pouca presença de dinâmicas de produção colaborativa entre os estudantes, enfim, coisas muito básicas, desde uh, uma resistência a partilhar o seu próprio fichamento com colegas, enfim. Isso tudo me impulsionou a pensar não é, a criação de formas de produção a colaborativa, tanto no, no, no ensino, mas no trabalho com os estudantes, da forma mais transversal possível. Não é? Então, é, imediatamente, pensamos não é, na, na, na manutenção de um, de um website, criações de listas, wikis, enfim, formas de envolver os estudantes na, no, no percurso mais coletivo. Não é? E, no segundo momento, isso virou projetos de extensão que passamos a realizar com ah, escolas próximas. Não é? Na verdade, um, uma escola que trabalhou mais diretamente, depois com professores ah, de sociologia, e aí uma articulação via Secretaria de Educação ah, de Guarulhos, pensando sempre em como que nós podíamos, né, junto a eles, desenvolver, identificar um problema que fosse de interesse comum, ah, transformar aquilo num problema de pesquisa, é, fazendo uso da tec das tecnologias da informação e transformar esse percurso num percurso de ensino-pesquisa é, de sociologia na educação básica. Não é? Quer dizer, o que está que em jogo aí, né, nesse momento? É, é, e aí que eu digo, né, quer dizer, que, na verdade, eu estava num processo de prática, não é, disso que depois eu vim tomar contato como ciência aberta, não é, quer dizer, mas havia um conjunto de experiências que estava em, que estava em contato, né, de biohacking, enfim, de práticas de, de, de colaboração mais radicais, é, que me inspiravam a pensar o campo da produção de conhecimento científico numa relação de transbordamento né, entre conhecimento acadêmico, conhecimento extra-acadêmico, conhecimento científico e extra-científico. Né? E, a partir daí, isso gerou uma seguinte questão, quer dizer, por que não pensar não é, a, a prática de ensino que acontece na escola, ou pensar os professores, pensar os estudantes, como potenciais cientistas? Não é? Então, quer dizer, isso pode parecer uma coisa trivial, 
mas uh, na universidade assim, há uma, uma, uma rígida distinção muito grande, e acho que nas humanidades é, isso também se faz sentir de uma maneira muito forte, é uma distinção tanto de status quanto enfim, de reconhecimento mesmo uh, acadêmico-científico entre as áreas de pesquisa consideradas científicas e as áreas de formação de professores. Né? É uma relação muito hierárquica. Aí. É, o que, de alguma maneira, se traduzia também no modo de relação entre universidade e escolas. Então, é dizer, é, pensar né, ou colocar a, isso como uma, uma, uma possibilidade de inversão, quer dizer, não é eliminar as diferenças, mas pensá-las de uma, uma forma, de uma relação mais de, de colaboração, quer dizer, o que, que significaria isso, então, do ponto das minhas práticas uh, de formação de professor, nas práticas com os estudantes e na relação com a escola, com os professores e com os estudantes daquela instituição, quer dizer, o que significaria, né, temos as nossas práticas, considerá-los todos como cientistas amadores. Não é? quer dizer, então, foi a partir dessas interrogações que, digamos, eu entrei em, em contato com esse amplo campo né, que, enfim, que nós estamos aqui discutindo, temos da, da, da ciência aberta, ciência cidadã, não é? é enfim, então, acho que foi, para mim, foi um, um digamos, um, um feliz encontro, não é? É, enfim, um pouco um espaço de diálogo então para também repensar um pouco essas essas questões que enfim, que eu estava enfrentando ali agora no segundo movimento eu queria introduzir um pouco essas as questões que estão surgindo uh, a partir né, dessa prática e aonde é que eu estou olhando que eu acho que pode ser também um campo frutífero de, de reflexão Uh, sobre os dilemas e os desafios que estão colocados para nós no campo dessa produção de conhecimento colaborativo, aberta e livre. Não é? É, eu estou, de alguma maneira, preocupado, né, portanto, a trabalhar com fenômenos sociais não é, da vida uh, tecnicamente mediada, enfim, um pouco uma sociologia da, da, da mediação técnica da, da vida, em que ah, nós estamos nesse ambiente de comunicação uh, ubíqua, não é? quer dizer, há uma a presença permanente dos nossos aí, dispositivos de, informa de, de, de comunicação, que estão também produzindo infinitamente dados na, em todas as nossas interações cotidianas. Né? Há também um pouco esse movimento, esse impulso de amplo acesso à informação e à transparência. Não é? Acontece que isso se dá num, num contexto, um contexto, digamos, sócio-histórico da tecnociência, de surgimento também, digamos, de um capitalismo informacional e de emergência também de novas formas de controle, quer dizer, a sociedade de controle e uma modulação da existência. Então, seguindo um pouco uma, uma, uma inspiração, aí, talvez, Foucaultiana, né, e acho que fazendo um, um, um diálogo com acho que a parte final da apresentação da Denise, não é? É, quer dizer, talvez de maneira análoga, aquilo que o Foucault estava discutindo, quer dizer, na emergência, quando que da emergência de novas formas de conhecimento, aquilo também se relaciona com a emergência de novas formas de governo, não é? Então, a economia política, a epidemiologia e como que isso enseja, não é? Novas formas também de, de governo da vida. Talvez não é? nós estejamos diante mesmo de um de um processo análogo, não é? Em que a emergência né, desse campo de relações sociais cibermediadas ah, com novas formas de produção, ela dá-se de maneira permanente também com a emergência de novas formas de poder e de controle. Então, quer dizer, há, há um pouco como questão de, de digamos, de fundo, não é? de, 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 das coisas aqui que talvez esteja tentando desenhar, né, como um projeto aí de investigação, o pano de fundo acho que é justamente essa questão, é dizer, a emergência dessas novas formas de conhecimento para e passo a desenvolvimento de novas formas de poder e de governo. Então, o que eu vou um pouco os slides seguintes que eu vou apresentar é um pouco uma, digamos, um, um, uma movimentação uh, mais rápida sobre um, um conjunto de experiências no campo da produção da ciência amadora, no campo da participação política, uh, que, de alguma maneira, falam, talvez, de um transbordamento uh, dessa ideia de participação social, acesso à informação. Tá? É, enfim, olhando mais especificamente para atores não é, que, digamos, poderiam ser né, o nosso objeto empírico, não é, que eu estou pensando aí como ativistas no campo da, do acesso à informação, Uh, eu acho que é um campo, digamos, são atores interessantes porque eles estão justamente numa fronteira de enfrentamento desses processos. Não é? E ao estar nessa situação de fronteira, isso ajuda a evidenciar alguns conflitos que estão em jogo e que muitas vezes não são facilmente percebidas dentro de ambientes mais é, 
confortáveis. Não é? Então, é, a, a, e aí olhando para esses casos, o que eu estou um pouco interrogando, não é? Quer dizer, o que, que nós podemos aprender com, em termos de, de novas práticas, não é? para aquilo que nós desenvolvemos também no campo do, do, da universidade, e aí eu estou pensando sempre mais especificamente no caso das ciências sociais e no caso da sociologia, não é? o que, que nós podemos aprender com organizações ou esses coletivos de tecnoativistas ou hackativistas, com grupos e movimentos que atuam em temas relacionados à tecnopolítica, à política informacional, à democratização do conhecimento e da cultura. Quais são as especificidades nos modos de conhecer inauguradas por essas tecnologias? Nós estamos falando de, de ciência aberta, transparência, indiciabilidade, rastreabilidade, simulação computacional, produção distribuída, crowdsourcing, mineração de dados, análise semântica, fenômenos de emergência, análise de padrões, entre outros. Enfim, são alguns elementos que passam a compor aí um novo repertório metodológico, às vezes epistemológico, que alguns autores vão denominar de ciências do silício, ciberciências ou digital science, as ciências digitais. Não é? Quer dizer, nesse sentido, eu acho que é interessante observarmos como um conjunto aí renovado de formas de produção colaborativa de conhecimento, ela se dá conjuntamente ao surgimento de práticas também renovadas do ativismo político. Não é? É, e também, ah, simultaneamente, é o surgimento de novas formas de governo. Né? A gente fala em governo 2.0, cidadania 2.0, enfim. É, então, é dizer, palavras ah, como participação distribuída, participação social, colaboração, transparência, acesso à informação, passam a integrar um vocabulário ah, comum entre ativistas, cientistas e gestores públicos, não é? Então, é dizer, tentando observar, não é, essa diversidade de experiências ainda nesse momento, pra, talvez o momento seguinte da pesquisa seja escolher alguns casos, não é, em cada um desses eixos para fazer um estudo mais aprofundado. Eu estou tentando mapear um pouco uma gramática comum, quer dizer, sentidos ah, para o que eles estão chamando de participação, para ah, acesso à informação, enfim, porque eu acho que não necessariamente estamos falando das mesmas coisas em cada um desses locais. Tá? É, aqui eu selecionei só alguns exemplos uh, de iniciativas, não é? que nós estamos aí chamando dentro desse guarda-chuva né, da ciência cidadã, que uh, aponta, eu acho, de uma maneira interessante para essa dissolução, digamos, ou de novas formas não é, de, de porosidade entre universidade e sociedade, entre saberes acadêmicos e saberes extra-acadêmicos. Né? Portanto, falamos em autoridade expandida, ciência amadora, alguns vão discutir em termos da, da crise dos experts. É, um autor não é, que, enfim, eu acho que foi uma, também uma, uma inspiração para, para algumas dessas discussões, o autor espanhol Antônio Lafuente, que, que faz uma problematização quer dizer, da emergência do que ele vai chamar do tecno-cidadão como condição para a democracia. Quer dizer, é uma problematização parecida com a que o Bruno Latour faz em termos da discussão de uma nova soberania, o parlamento dos objetos. Quer dizer, discutir ciência aberta, não é? e mais especificamente a ciência cidadã, implica, portanto, pensar no contexto uh, mais amplo e identificarmos as encruzilhadas que estão postas em cada uma dessas dimensões. E atualizar as relações entre ciência, tecnologia e democracia. Esta mesma reivindicação de abertura e participação é fundamento de novas práticas políticas, formas de participação online, ciberdemocracia, democracia 2.0, experiências de inovação cidadã, enfim, diversas ah, experiências aí que, de alguma maneira, também estão interrogando o sistema de... Dizer, provocando não é, interrogações sobre o sistema de representação e de deliberação. Não é? É, em certa medida problemas sobre é, decisões políticas, deliberação, dizer, são questões que também aparecem nos debates ah, entre produção de conhecimento científico ah, aplicado não é, em, em conflito com um campo, muitas vezes, de contra-expertise é, sobre determinados assuntos. Aí você tem embates muito interessantes. Não é? Então, é dizer, essas... Ah, enfim, e aqui eu selecionei só alguns casos a maioria deles são experiências brasileiras, não é? É, de uso de ferramentas e tecnologias para uh, potencializar as formas de participação, para 
enfim, criar processos decisórios mais, digamos, participativos. Quer dizer, mas eu acho que cada um desses casos, assim, ele demanda um, uma investigação própria para a gente ver, bom, o que, o que eles estão falando exatamente, qual é o tipo de participação que ocorre aí, não é? E, e qual é, ah, digamos, a, a, não é? eu estou pensando em termos da, digamos, da, da tecnopolítica, né, que de alguma maneira inspira esse projeto, quer dizer, como que é feita a gestão dos dados, a disponibilização deles, é, porque há uma, há uma, 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 uma digamos uma estranha semelhança não é, digamos, entre todas essas, essas experiências né? mas acho que mais de perto a gente começa a entender um pouco que há uma nuance aí bastante significativa entre os modos de participação é... então acho que um pouco né eu acho que começa né a aparecer aí né talvez uma um problema também transversal a essas iniciativas, é uma dicotomia entre ah, as ações, digamos, de livre acesso à informação, né, as políticas relacionadas à transparência, tensionadas, por outro lado, com uma dimensão de controle social. Quer dizer, não controle cidadão, controle sobre o cidadão. Não é? Então, acho que esse binômio aí é alguma coisa para a qual é, eu gostaria de olhar. Não é? Quer dizer, quando a gente transpõe essa questão para o campo das ciências humanas, especialmente para as ciências sociais, é, essa é uma atenção que está presente desde a origem não é? da, da sociologia. Não é? Quer dizer, conhecer, interpretar, e, por outro lado, também quer dizer, formas de controle, formas de governo. Então, não é uma velha questão. É, quer dizer, não é uma nova questão, é uma antiga questão, mas que ganha novos contornos, novas uh, formas aí de, de efetivação no real. Então, é, só para... Né, eu peguei dois casos aqui para contrapor um pouco. Né, quer dizer, a gente tem um campo é, emergente aí das humanidades digitais, né, esse é um, um, é um portal de uma, de uma experiência, de uma rede uh, brasileira não é, de humanidades digitais, é um grupo muito interessante. Quer dizer, esse é um, um campo rico, digamos, de produção de conhecimento no campo das humanidades mediante o uso das tecnologias. Quer dizer, acontece que isso se dá conjuntamente a um campo aplicado também das humanidades, não é? naquilo que a gente poderia né, apontar mais em termos de uma engenharia social. Não é? Então, quer dizer, há uma, há uma tensão que está colocada aí, é, digamos, entre essas novas formas de conhecimento e, enfim, a forma como isso também se traduz em novas formas aí de potencialmente novas formas de, de gestão da vida. Então, portanto, a questão um pouco que eu estou querendo provocar, não é? Quer dizer, quais são as fronteiras, não é? é e como fazer o, o pêndulo oscilar mais para o lado das práticas críticas e emancipatórias, as práticas mais que potencializam, digamos, essa radicalização democrática, né? Quer dizer, nesse sentido, uh, uh, essas questões elas foram em parte provocadas uh, na observação e no contato com grupos que estão, digamos, fazendo uma ação de confronto, fazendo uma ação de enfrentamento à, enfim, à política, às formas da política informacional, não é? é e aí eu acho muito curioso que nos últimos dois anos, três anos, eles são, enfim, isso já vem acontecendo há mais tempo, mas depois de junho do ano passado, sinceramente, eu, eu nunca vi uh, uma produção tão difusa e tão uh, grande não é, de manuais de segurança circulando agora na internet. Não é? Então, é, isso, enfim, acho que não dá para tirar nenhuma conclusão disso, mas é, é, um, é um sintoma, talvez, de algo. Quer dizer, a gente recentemente passou a observar uma produção e o surgimento de grupos que realmente estão falando uh, abertamente de, uh, e organizando atividades para a difusão de criptografia, de comunicação segura. Quer dizer, um pouco foi, né, digamos, a. a, a o contato e a observação digamos, desses grupos que, de alguma maneira, provocou uma, um aprofundamento de questões uh, que, de alguma maneira, elas não estavam surgindo de uma maneira tão urgente uh, num campo de discussão sobre uh, acesso à informação, sobre participação online. Não é? É, então, é, dizer, é um pouco uma, o exercício né, que eu, de alguma maneira, estou tentando fazer aqui, é digamos, olhar para esses grupos que estão realmente numa situação mais de, de fronteira, é, porque talvez eles estejam antecipando ah, alguma das questões que 
enfim, diversos grupos aí já estão uh, vivenciando na sua, na sua prática. Não é? Então, para... Né, eu acho que o que começa, né, eu acho que talvez a é, sintetizar um pouco né, essa, a discussão que esses grupos estão fazendo sobre, sobre criptografia, é, eles re, frequentemente né, eles repetem uma máxima né, dos, do, dos cipherpunks, quer dizer, transparência para governos e empresas, privacidade para os cidadãos. Não é? Acontece que, na prática, isso não é tão fácil de ser implementado. Não é? Dadas as condições da mediação das tecnologias digitais na vida cotidiana, essa fronteira ela não é exatamente tão facilmente uh, estabelecida. Não é? Então, aqui são alguns exemplos né, de outro, outro grupo também brasileiro. Uh, aqui um outro coletivo né, que enfim, trabalha com projetos interessantes aqui no Brasil. É, parte de algum dos sites né, que, enfim, que eu gostaria de mostrar aqui, que é um pouco um repositório né, de projetos que nós desenvolvemos no Pimenta Lab, Nesse momento ele está é, fora do ar porque esse, essa, essa comunidade ela hospedava alguns dos projetos que nós estávamos desenvolvendo e o servidor deles foi apreendido recentemente pelo Ministério Público Federal por conta de uma, de uma investigação mais ampla e que, enfim, que toca diretamente em questões relativas aí à liberdade de expressão, à liberdade de conhecimento. Não é? e, enfim, um, um servidor que estava também hospedado numa numa universidade, não é? é enfim, só para citar um pouco um exemplo, né, de como que ah, algumas iniciativas dessas, né, e aí inclusive a, a opção, né, digamos de junto aos estudantes fazer o uso de uma tecnologia e tentar ter, né, uma, o maior grau possível de autonomia na gestão dos recursos tecnológicos ajudou a, a evidenciar para eles também é, o funcionamento da internet, quer dizer, porque uma coisa é a gente criar um site, botar uma coisa na nuvem lá, não é? E a outra coisa é a gente construir, né, desde desde a base, né, é dizer como que a gente administra um servidor, o que, que significa ter um, um, um IP, né? Uh, Internet Protocol, né? um IP fixo para a gente poder desenvolver um projeto e hospedar um, um, um site, quer dizer. É, tudo isso ajuda a evidenciar um pouco um elemento de ordem aí política que é transversal a, ao, ao uso não é, dessas tecnologias. Portanto, tentando sair um pouco de uma, de, um, de uma dimensão mais do usuário para uma discussão mesmo de, de aprendizagem e de apropriação aí tecnológica, não é? É, enfim, para concluir, uh, gostaria de retomar então aquela questão colocada no início do texto. É, o que, que nós podemos aprender? É, enfim, esse, antes de concluir, só citar um outro exemplo aqui, né, falando um pouco daquela questão da, da dificuldade né, da, das fronteiras né, do público privado aí na gestão da informação. É, recentemente eu vi essa informação, eu achei, eu achei muito. É, Acho que é forte, enfim, essa, esse dado. Né? Acho que não dá para a gente ficar pensando, tratando essas coisas de uma maneira muito natural. É, que as catracas em Florianópolis, se eu não me engano, e agora também em São Paulo, elas passarão a fazer o reconhecimento facial dos usuários. Não é? Quer dizer, onde estão sendo uh, guardados esses dados, de que forma, quem pode acessar, enfim. É, são novos problemas. Não é? Então, é dizer, o que a gente pode aprender com as questões que estão sendo provocadas por esses uh, por esses grupos, né? Quer dizer, como noções de participação, colaboração, acesso à informação estão presentes em diversas dessas iniciativas no campo da ciência aberta, no campo da ciência cidadã, nas formas também renovadas de participação política. Como dar a elas um sentido que seja mais emancipador, mais democrático? Em se tratando das práticas cibermediadas, quais são as configurações sociotécnicas, protocolos que podemos estabelecer para que a ciência aberta, a ciência cidadã, caminhe no sentido de uma participação crítica e ativa nessa, num processo de, enfim, de expansão democrática. Não é? Então, acho que tem aí, não é, a, talvez, um conjunto de três eixos de, de, de questões aí que para mim estão presentes, né? é, um primeiro eixo relacionado à, à importância de problematizarmos a tecnicidade específica do digital, né? Portanto, quais são as configurações sociotécnicas e seus efeitos, quais os requisitos mínimos, software livre, abertura, digitalização de todo o processo, é, cloud computing, enfim, isso acho que são questões que são de uma tecnicidade específica, mas elas têm consequências, são escolhas 
importantes. Uma outra tensão também que está permanentemente colocada é relativa à economia política da informação. Não é? Então, quer é dizer, acesso à informação, ah, ela está ela num campo de embate, não é? de uma discussão sobre domínio público, propriedade intelectual, commons, não é? É dizer, é, livre para o mercado, livre do mercado, né? free from, from market, free for market. Enfim, é, uma, é um problema enfim, que já tem enfim, um, um acúmulo bastante grande de discussões. Né? E o terceiro eixo, que é, enfim, talvez, no, digamos, da, numa perspectiva macro, que está, portanto, aí presente, é a relação entre ciência, tecnologia e democracia. Não é? é isso. Eu, enfim, eu, Deixa o resto aqui para a gente conversar aqui na sessão de debate. Tá? Muito obrigado. Obrigada a todos os professores que fizeram suas conferências, pelo compartilhamento de experiências tão diversificadas, Europa, Estados Unidos, Ásia, Brasil, em relação à ciência aberta, educação científica, alfabetização científica. Bom, então, pensando todos juntos que após uma liberação histórica né, do trabalho maquínico, parece que pensamos e desenhamos em locais diferentes do mundo hoje, uma sociedade onde todas as pessoas terão a oportunidade de fazer ciência por si mesmas. Como diria o professor Paul David, pensamos né, a República da Ciência, a República da Ciência aberta, um novo momento histórico. Ou, poderíamos dizer, a ciência aberta e seus amigos. Ou, como colocou agora o Henrique Parra, uma sociedade é, em que, ao mesmo tempo, temos os seus inimigos, os inimigos da ciência aberta com seus controles e regulação. Eu vou abrir, Eu vou abrir então, para perguntas do público, mas vou pedir para que os conferencistas... Venham para a mesa, por favor. É, eu acho que é uma, per... é uma pergunta para a mesa, né? principalmente, talvez, para é, Denisa e Ellen, né? é, que apresentaram é, projetos, experiências de ciência cidadã, mais no campo das hard science, né? e o Henrique trabalhou mais a questão no plano das, das ciências sociais, né, avançando para algumas outras questões. É, a minha questão é a seguinte, quer dizer, como é que vocês veriam a diferença entre isso que a gente está chamando de ciência cidadã é, no contexto da ciência aberta e as, e as ideias mais antigas de educação científica né? e eu acho que o David aí também pode talvez comentar alguma coisa de educação científica e de popularização da ciência quer dizer me, me pareceu vendo as, que eu conheço pouco esse campo vendo as experiências as experiências de vocês que o intuito era muito no sentido de levar a ciência é, é, para o cidadão né é, de algum modo o cidadão é, comum, né, não, não, não especialista, poder colocar a mão na massa, quebrar um pouco essa ideia de, de que só os especialistas podem chegar a esse mundo da ciência. Mas eu não sei até que ponto a, é, essas experiências também estimulam uma perspectiva crítica em relação ao próprio campo científico e abrem possibilidades de uma maior intervenção e participação do cidadão é, na, no, no próprio, na própria lógica científica dominante. Né? Então, eu fiquei um pouco com essa, com essa dúvida. Até porque as, as experiências que vocês trouxeram, e talvez haja coisas aí que eu não conheço, eram experiências de um, um tipo de ciência é, mais, vamos dizer assim, que, que, que não envolve um, um nível de sofisticação muito grande. Quer dizer, eu fico me perguntando se experiências mais sofisticadas no campo da ciência são possíveis nesses, nesse tipo de espaços e de iniciativas que vocês apresentaram. Mais alguma pergunta? Opa, a gente está aqui com o... participação online também no, no IRC e tem oito pessoas. 
é, conversando aqui, além das que estiverem assistindo sem estar no IRC. Uma delas, o Walter, que ele é professor... É, é, peraí, ah, trabalha na Universidade Metodista, ministrando Web Science. Ele pergunta para o Henrique é, como, como poderíamos fazer Open Science para a construção de tecnologias sociais, ou seja, que a sociedade diz que são importantes para ela, e não que os grupos econômicos ou o governo dizem que são importantes. Então, Open Science e tecnologias sociais. Obrigado. Eu tenho uma pergunta, primeiro direta a David, mas, na verdade, eu acho que todos os outros são relevantes para os outros falantes também. And the question has to do, you made a very specific reference to the fact that even though the village very successful in terms of the project with the dam and all those kind of activities, it didn't, it didn't spread to another village. It wasn't, wasn't taken up by others. And so I'm very curious as to the kind of diffusion uh, that goes also to, to Denise's uh, observation. So that are these things are kind of, why do they, why do they don't spread? And then, If they don't spread, can we be as optimistic as you are in terms of generalizing, uh, as well as with uh, Henrik's works about, you know, how, how, how far can we make generalizations about these kind of phenomena in terms of democratizing knowledge and collaborations and so forth? Uh, no início do ano, o Google ele lançou um projeto com uma parceria com outras empresas para desenvolver um celular que fosse formado por blocos. Então, ao invés de você comprar o celular todo fechado, como você, com uma câmera que já foi definida pelo fabricante, uma placa de rede, uma tela com uma resolução qualquer, você poderia montar seu próprio celular, você escolheria a câmera que você quisesse, o som, a tela e outras coisas. Uh, Talvez isso pudesse ser utilizado para uh, biohackers, biolabs, e talvez na área educacional, talvez vocês quisessem comentar alguma coisa. Nós vamos encerrar esse primeiro bloco, então, com essas quatro questões, para que os professores possam responder. ok? Professora Denisa, ou professor David, ou Ellen. Denisa? Denisa? Ellen? Okay. Uh, I guess I'm addressing the first question. So I, 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 it was kind of a long question. Uh, the part that uh, I remember was at the end you asked about more sophisticated things that could possibly be done in these labs. The main barrier is always the equipment. And so it, it depends on the cleverness of biohackers to see whether or not we can reverse engineer that equipment or maybe form alliances. We've been doing a lot with trying to partner with educational institutions and companies and trying to get them to join us in certain projects We just did a microbiome study of a very polluted waterway in New York, and the deep DNA sequencing is going to be done by local universities at no cost. So um, I'm, I'm not sure what the bigger context of your question was. Can you repeat it? I'm sorry. Uh, é, se, você tá com, se esses espaços, qual é a diferença desses, desse tipo de experiência, né, de citizen science, e as antigas práticas, antigas e atuais práticas né, de popularização e educação científica, que a ideia de popularização e educação científica era levar a ciência para o cidadão. Em que medida essas experiências se diferem né, dessa perspectiva? Né? Oh. Hands-on, that's it, hands-on. Most of those things bring a demonstration. You might have a, uh, a brief period of hands-on, but if you talk to the students and the people that work in the lab that have actually gained a competency, that, that are designing their own experiments, that are doing things that you don't necessarily know the answer 
they're failing, they're trying different things. It's, there's no place in science education right now where you get the feel of what it's really like to be in a lab and where 90% of what you do doesn't work. So that, everyone says the feedback is that that's a very valuable lesson or um, uh, understanding of science as a process rather than just something that you learn from an online course or uh, from a demonstration or a visit to a laboratory. Um, it's different when you're, you're making your own equipment, you're deciding what you're going to do, you're, you've got people to help you, but, but you're running the, running the show. Um, I think I'll just add some things that actually Ellen mentioned. Um, the difference between these traditional science communication projects and some new like public participation in science type of projects, and I believe these type of maker, hacker, DIY activities or these alternative organizations that do science or some form of technology R&D. Um, in, in my opinion, it brings much more interesting like stakeholders relations. Well, in a typical science communication, you just know it's like science labs that basically hire someone to help them communicate. Sometimes there are some forms of uh, these uh, public forums where people participate in science, but it is not hands-on. It could be hands-on, but it's still not radical in terms of giving to these citizen scientists or groups of citizens something of an institutional um, alliance. So being a member of a hacker space, you become a partner also as an institution. So at least in Indonesia, for me, the most interesting part is actually the stakeholders relations formed around such practices because you have citizen science lab, you have village community, you have university department taking part as equal part, they're equal in, in these projects they're working on. And I actually see evidence of dissemination at least in Indonesia, these little workshops that were done around microscopes in Jakarta, they spread to other cities. But it's not like you cannot say it was the technology. It was really like some individuals that liked what these guys were doing and they reproduced it. So I, my, my feeling, and I know about, of other projects where this happened, my feeling about what didn't maybe work in Thailand, that these village communities didn't have any other like meetings or they don't meet regularly or there is not much contact between them or, you know, like that's, that's just my intuition about it because in, in places where, like in Indonesia, they're so well connected between these cities and they're so much community oriented. They're actually a model for, in my opinion, for Western science, how it should be involved with the communities. So if you ask me what is the difference, I really believe is this like, emphasis on stakeholders relations and not on communication, not on some just public uh, deliberation, which is, I believe, just like a posh word for companies or research institutes influencing and manipulating the citizen or just making it look like it was democratic when it's not. So in that sense also, I've made that last statement. I do believe like a good technology, for example, nanopore sequencing, which is cheaper and better, will make better citizen science. I don't think one is like high end and the other is low end and people are just catching up. Good technology does enable this democratization and participation. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, well, it's a great discussion, and all the contributions are wonderful, so it takes way too long. So always the hope, and I don't know how, but maybe some of the things that, you know, various people that the, he have spoken about, to be able to keep the conversation going after the end of the conference, such as, you know, these are, no one's going to answer anything in minutes. Mm -hmm. And they're important, and we're going to keep learning. So having the environment and space to keep it going after we leave, whenever we leave, uh, would be, I think, really essential and important. And just to touch on, on OK. Just touch on a, on a couple of the things. Um, you know, when 
Ellen mentioned the importance of hands-on. It, it's absolutely true. It's so much of s s traditional education is giving information about something. And you couldn't really do something. And a lot of that was the limitation of costs and materials. So limitation, a long time ago I was at a workshop at the very beginning of the web that Harvard had for its law school to think about, because they thought their critical advantage was their library, what they, what they had, and then the professors that were there. Mais próximo, ok. Tá bom. É, sempre, né? É, tecnologia é uma resposta e sempre tem problemas. Né? <laughs> ok. Uh, uh, oh, so, so, too much of school was just telling about something. So, the Harvard conference was like, once there's a web, what's the advantage of Harvard Law School? What's, why would they be better than, you know, uh, Chia Ana's Law School or, or even the Third, the primary school down the street. And so it, it's, it's very democratizing in that sense, but what also needed to change with the availability of the technology is a change in the process that enables really to take advantage of the technology. And so hands-on is certainly one part. <laughs> the social forces on the other side. At MIT, when we first became, the whole campus was wireless. A professor in mechanical and engineering and I made a proposal to the university to totally change. MIT has lecture lab. You have your big shot professor for lecture and you do your laboratory with graduate students. And everybody accepted in the laboratory, hands-on is where you're really going to learn. So he said, if it's wireless and we have these new devices, why make this separation? Why not just make that with the professor who has the most experience? Do the laboratory right there. Change the, don't do lecture, here's theory, there's practice. Join it. And we said, but you need time to really rethink the course, rethink how you're going to do it, even the how concepts, in which order might you get concepts, which concepts are most important. So we made this grand proposal when the university asked, so what was the response of the university, or of our department, his department? It worked for you, it's worked in the past, don't change it. And, and, you know, so, you know, at MIT, it's, you know, there's a joke that, uh, you know, you won't get tenure as a professor if you're a good teacher, only for your research, right? So it's what's valued, but not because it's better, even measurably better. But I would add to hands-on the importance of, of, of not just hands-on, but when the idea of making, what was interesting with what they're doing, or you think about it in terms of chemistry, same. If you think of chemistry as engineering, or you think of what you're doing, they're making stuff. They're not just doing an experiment to observe something and draw an inference. They're really making. And this is essential. You know, so, and then you're making something that you could care about. They don't say, here's the project everybody has to do. I come to this space. I get expert help. I have things I can make. Maybe I need to make the tool even better. And then you know, I really learn because I care about what I'm learning. Well, we don't do that in school. It's standardized. So it's easy to test, and it's easier to give information about. Not because it's better for learning. So it's really a social shift that needs to happen. That, it's a political shift that has to happen. And, and the hacker spaces and do-it-yourself movement are really important in this. On the other hand, my observation, and it's not scientific in the least, in the US, with hacker spaces and do-it-yourself spaces, it's actually increasing inequity because the people who go are the ones who either themselves or their parents value this and will go there. And it's not, so it's actually increasing inequity in education because the people, because it's not part of the system, it's not from the government, and the people who choose to go or where these spaces are or who hears about them, they're not in the communities that would really, that have the worst education and would also really benefit. So the, the last part to Leslie's, I'm sorry to go so long. Uh, you know, for both the uh, LNS is like ownership. Well, no, there really was ownership. And also there, in these villages, they actually, in these in particular, there is a lot of interaction. 
and so, you know, it, it's, it's not just that, no, it's only at a particular time, or no, they didn't do it. They actually did, because it was on their own. They took these ideas to the others because they regularly met, because in some ways that's how their markets work, right? They're not only self-sufficient entities. So it, it wasn't that either, and it's, it, I don't have an answer for this, but it's something I think about a lot and wrote about it in terms of models of growth, in that what the deepest part was so it's kind of like to, to think about you know, the, the, the unit that we're thinking about the problem is. What easily transferred was a particular application, let's call it. Here's how we purified the water, or here's how we use check dams. And that's easy. That really, it kind of spreads. But it, what really makes this, these few villages really particularly interesting from my perspective is that they own the process of it's their community, how are they going to improve it, how do they decide how it should be, and, and what's the way they use the technology and the questions in order to do that. But as much as people in science and in development and in education talk about evidence-based, it's, it's, no one's against evidence, obviously, but it's, it's what counts as evidence and what are you testing is really hard. And in these cases where you have strong evidence of much better accepted results, but it's not just so simple. You're really thinking about a cultural shift. It's hard to understand what it is and how to get there. And this is why it's hard to think about the scaling, but it's the most super important thing. We know most of our old ways of thinking about it don't work. So the old way of thinking about how do you replicate, where well, replicate's the exactly wrong word, except in a very small thing. You know, how do you scale it? Well, that's right in intent. Um, you know, but we, we don't think about what's the system, what's the nature of the system that we're trying to replicate. And particularly for a system that's open and dynamic, you can't think of replication, right? And it's why the kind of biological things are great metaphors, to, you know, great to use as things to think to project into something like this, where biology is really great at replication, right? For good or bad. But uh, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> no, that, that. That's a really good point because, you know, I had this vision of, oh, well, we'll have gen spaces or things like that all over the world. But every situation is so completely different, and the, the users don't want to use it in the same way either. So it's, it's kind of the overall thing, but just as biology, it's going gonna, it's gonna to evolve in its own way in each environment. É, só um, enfim, um comentário, acho que os colegas colocaram já, acho que vários elementos para essa relação entre ciência cidadã, ciência aberta e difusão científica. Né? Eu queria só um pouco apontar, eu acho que há uma, a, talvez uma, uma mudança significativa aí de, de contexto, né, em que, uh, enfim, quando a gente fala, uh, ou quando se discutia né, a difusão científica, é, pensava-se um certo tipo de relação entre universidade e sociedade, entre saberes acadêmicos e saberes extra-acadêmicos. Né? E parece que, hoje, por diversas razões, há uma clara percepção e reivindicação de que inúmeras questões no campo do desenvolvimento científico e tecnológico afetam nossas vidas de uma maneira talvez muito mais intensa, é, ou, enfim, ou percebemos isso de uma forma muito mais intensa. Né? Então, a... a Há talvez uma, uma ampliação também da discussão da, a, do campo exclusivo de, da difusão científica, como saber científico que se transmite, não é, para educar as pessoas cientificamente, para uma reivindicação de uma espécie de uma cidadania científica, de uma, né, que o Lafonte vai falar da tecnocidadãos, quer dizer, uma percepção de que é, há um domínio de um conhecimento científico aí necessário para que eu possa intervir também nas decisões políticas que estão sendo tomadas, não é? é? Isso eu acho que fala, portanto, de uma talvez uma, uma, uma recomposição não é, das relações entre não é, os locais uh, tradicionalmente estabelecidos como locais de produção uh, privilegiada de conhecimento em oposição àquilo que está fora, não é? Quer dizer, parece que essa fronteira por diversos mecanismos aí ela se torna talvez mais mais porosa permitindo ou intensificando questões que já estavam presentes aí para algumas para algumas pessoas que estavam discutindo a difusão científica, né? É, agora acho que é importante ah, 
apontar que quando fala em, em ciência também, em ciência cidadã, há, assim, cabe muitas coisas aí dentro. Não é? Então, a e é um, acho que talvez um conceito ainda bastante impreciso, não é? Porque há tanto, digamos, num, num, num espectro, né? num extremo, a gente poderia colocar a simples, a, não é simples, mas a, a, a pura abertura dos dados e, dos e do processo de produção, para que se conheça, se utilize aquelas informações, isso pode ser visto como ciência aberta, ou no segundo movimento, portanto, né, compartilhamento de, de informações entre os cientistas. Quer dizer, um, talvez um segundo nível em que os cientistas compartilham os resultados das suas pesquisas ou os dados brutos com os cidadãos. Um, talvez um terceiro nível em que os cidadãos participam da produção dos dados, então eles passam também a atuar como agentes que produzem a, a, a informação que vai ser aí, portanto, analisada. E talvez um, um outro nível em que cientistas e não cientistas estão juntos na elaboração dos problemas que serão investigados, não é? é então, enfim, e tudo isso está dentro desse grande escopo de ciência cidadã. No entanto, acho que há nuances importantes aí, não é? E só com uma para não, não esquecer a pergunta do, do colega lá da, da, da metodista, né, que fez online. É, ontem nós estávamos comentando isso, quer dizer, essa discussão né, no campo da ciência aberta, de certa maneira, ela, eu, eu, eu acho que ela tem profundas relações com o, o, o debate sobre tecnologia social, quer dizer, que é também já um já um debate aí de quase 30 anos, não é, sobre produção de ciência e tecnologia, sobre desenvolvimento local, sobre uh, ciência uh, e democracia. Uh, que tem já um acúmulo histórico aí. Então, eu, eu acho que parece importante, uh, uh, talvez, a gente, de fato, se aproximar para uma troca de, de, de conhecimentos e experiências, porque acho que há já um, um acúmulo uh, histórico importante nessas discussões, não é? que, de alguma maneira, estavam sendo chamadas de, de, de tecnologia social, é, as discussões sobre desenvolvimento local, né? enfim, tem, tem bastante coisa aí que de alguma maneira, se reatualiza nesse novo contexto. Né? Isso. Então, vou passar para o próximo bloco de perguntas. É, professor Alexandre, nós temos, é, nós temos, então, mais ou menos 15 a 20 minutos, quando vai ser encerrada aqui essa conferência da parte da manhã. Ok? Um, okay, so uh, thanks for for this great uh, discussion, and I think that we're, you, in this last round of of, of uh, debate, we were getting closer to what I was trying to 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 uh, throw into the into the, this, the discussion, which is if we can come up with a with some sort of a shared or common idea of what participation in science and technology is here, uh, because when I think about participation, I have a, a sort of a um, an idea that comes from political theory, so more increased participation, according to me, it means increased, uh, it's about who decides something and who benefits from something. Um, so this is quite different from an idea of, of open and participatory science and technology in terms of uh, more science, faster science, or faster technological evolution, and more distributed technological evolution. This is, this is very different from, my, from, from the more uh, the, the, the idea of participation rooted, let's say, in, in, a, in a more political uh, uh, way of seeing things. So I wonder, just to uh, flip a little bit the discussion here, to switch it a little bit, if, in your, in your if, you, if we can come with a, sh with a shared definition, if we can come up with a shared definition, and if in your experience there is something that is more productive in terms of making science and technology more equal and, and, more, and more democratic, but which comes from decreased participation. For example, uh, 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 experiences of communities that refuse, for example, scientific and technological evolution when it, when it is against uh, a more equal and more democratic world. So my, in, to, the importance of maybe uh, uh, slowing down or stopping scientific evolution, this, is this something that you will uh, include in your idea of what a more open science is? So a more open science could be something that is more easily uh, uh, stoppable or, or repurposed, uh, for example. I don't know if my, my, the idea is uh, that I would, I'm trying to express is clear, but uh, the importance of also non-participation and st stopping and slowing down technology. It's typical of hacker culture, so net strikes or you know, bombing websites to block them, it's, 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 it's important in the political evolution of our, of our <coughs> digital societies.
Olá, é, todas as palestras foram muito legais, gostaria de agradecer também, foi muito inspirador e, e interessante as palestras. E, mas eu gostaria de uh, uh, levantar uma questão na, no, no quesito do... E agora, o que vai acontecer no, no futuro? Ou o que vocês acham que vai acontecer no futuro? Né? Sei lá, a gente passou... Começou nos anos 80, a gente estava conversando isso ontem, até mesmo com, com o Alessandro e a Denise, a gente passou pelos anos 80 e anos 90 aí com os cypherpunks, que foram realmente... O, a, eu acredito que o começo assim, mais... É, é, marcante dessa coisa nova que o pessoal chama de uma ciência tecnossocial quase e, e, e até criaram um manifesto biopunk depois recentemente né em que eles colocaram de uma maneira muito bonita lá de que uh, eles defendem que você ter a, a liberdade para entender a natureza e questionar a natureza mas não somente isso e, e e atrás as maneiras como experimentar com a natureza para ter respostas para suas perguntas como um direito fundamental de, de qualquer pessoa, né? E eu, eu queria perguntar para vocês se poderiam elaborar um pouco mais como que vocês veem como vai ser no futuro em, em relação à, à mudança da maneira de como a gente faz a produção, o desenvolvimento, a comunicação e até mesmo o compartilhamento dessa informação de, de tecnológica e científica. Uh, ou se tudo isso que, tá, que a gente está discutindo aqui agora vai ser apenas uma alternativa à atual, atual maneira de se fazer esse tipo de coisa. Aproveitando o conjunto de perguntas, eu também queria encaminhar uma, uma questão aqui para todos os conferencistas. Ontem, na sua palestra, na sua conferência brilhante, o professor Paul David apontou a relevância do apoio da universidade para a República da Ciência Aberta. Né? E, e o seu o mesmo papel fundamental da universidade, da comunidade, dos cientistas, dos pesquisadores, e isso num retrospecto histórico. Nós vemos hoje aqui, nessa mesa, é, vários professores onde suas iniciativas, seus projetos têm apoio das universidades e com diferentes desenhos. E a questão que me, que me vem, é, vendo e ouvindo diferentes experiências é, e desenhos institucionais, Universidade de Singapura, MIT, uma, uma experiência diferenciada, né, talvez que seria interessante depois é, perceber como é, é, que foi a criação do Gene Space, que vem numa relação com a sociedade, emerge da própria sociedade. Isso me criou muita curiosidade, como é que, se, como é que emerge né, um, um grupo de cientistas é, e retorna isso para a sociedade nesta relação de empoderamento. Então, a minha, a minha pergunta, a minha questão né, para os conferencistas é justamente é, o que eles pensam né, da universidade, neste momento, né, como uma pergunta agora né, do, do Otton, né, quando relembra né, os punks, e numa espécie de revolução, o como, né, o que a universidade deve, deve fazer, né, vamos dizer assim, de uma forma geral, de uma diretriz, para fomentar essas experiências. Então, essa é a minha, essa é a minha questão para para os conferencistas. Are we going through all the questions sequentially? <laughs> It's a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, just a, a brief uh, brief comment about um, using uh, these spaces to block technology. Um, there was a debate in the beginning at GenSpace as to whether or not we would allow people to work on projects that they could patent. And there were some people that were very opposed to it. Um, 
and there were some people that were in favor of it. And we decided in the end that we weren't going to limit anybody from doing anything. And we were just going to leave it in the hands of whoever came in. And I, I think I would feel the same way. Uh, my big thing is how can you make a decision about something if you don't understand it? So it, if you're talking about citizen participation in making decisions about science, I think it's very dangerous to make decisions about things that you don't understand at all because then you can be swayed by people that prey on your fears about the technology. I mean, there's a lot of videos on genetic engineering by anti-GMO people that suggest that if you eat a genetically modified tomato, somehow that DNA gets into you and does something terrible to you. So it, unless you have a small understanding of the process, then you're a victim of that. That's my feeling on that. So I think the, the education or the understanding, not education, the understanding, especially hands-on, comes even before the ability to participate in the decision-making because sometimes you don't even know there's a decision that's to be made. If you don't understand how someone can take a piece of chewing gum that you've spit out on the street and learn your biomedical information from it, you won't even be in the process of making the decision. So I think there's a spectrum but also a hierarchy. Um, and then um, uh, with regards to institutions and biopunks, um, we were banned from iGEM. MIT uh, was sponsoring iGEM, and they banned all DIY labs and teams. They wouldn't even talk to us because some of the so-called biopunks had published these manifestos and made the institutions a villain. And there was a lot of bad feeling. And it wasn't until this year when the competition moved out of MIT into a neutral space that we were welcomed back. And it was all posturing. There was nothing inherently disruptive or bad about what we were doing if you compared it to science education. But the way it was phrased as if, the, the way I see it is, yeah, I can say I want to be a mechanic on the pit crew of uh, a race car, a Ferrari, but I don't know anything about engineering or Ferraris. So I can't say that they're withholding that information from me <laughs> and not allowing me to participate in working on a Ferrari. <laughs> I have to find the information. Maybe it's difficult to find and you can make it easier. Or maybe I have to find someone to teach me, but I still it's still an apprenticeship. It, it, there's still a, a certain amount of um, responsibility on the person that wants to change nature or do this to get off their butt and learn it. And that process can be accelerated if some of the technology makes it easier or uh, particularly the sequencing technology if it's cheaper, but there's still um, an obligation of the biopunk to educate themselves and the university to, you know, to assist, but it's not all on the university, and it shouldn't all be on the biopunk. Okay. Is it? Uh, so one question was more on the disobedience and um, uh, more in terms of cui bono of any type of technological development and how we make decisions, which I think it's a central question we should answer. Um, and um, I, I guess my take would be uh, more people be involved in all the process of product 
production of scientific facts and we bring more stakeholders together better in terms of whatever decisions that group of people makes. And I wish to see more like micro decisions. So something about your way, Alessandro, of looking at it like we have to make some big decisions is, I think it's always wrong when we make such big decisions, but we can make small decisions. And I'm not so convinced that all GMO it's like um, it, we have to talk about concrete GMOs. Another problem with GMO is Monsanto, of course. Yeah. And, and yeah. so it's, it's not like a decision we can make in an easy way, and, um, and we should make it as micro decisions. So f I guess the reason I'm interested in these movements is because they change the relation between the laboratory, the parliament, and the street. Yeah or they just introduce more institutions, more intermediaries, they enable more micro decisions. That would be my answer to that. In terms of universities, that's a scary one. <laughs> um, I, I guess that's a whole conference, just what is the role of universities now, how independent they are. So I guess I would just say I'm in favor of any institution that preserves some form of autonomy for and autonomy in terms of doing research, in terms of asking difficult questions, in terms of rethinking some extreme scenarios of the future. And this is, in my opinion, the function of the university, and we are struggling whether we are still that type of institution because of all the bureaucratization. There are these hacker spaces, and I mean these spaces do offer some alternative, and, and I like to be involved in both because for different reasons, it's good to, to have that connection and be in touch more with the society, maybe. Um, um comentário à pergunta do Alessandro. É, Alessandro, uh, acho que quando a gente fala, em, de fato, em participação, não é, a gente tem que qualificar o que, que nós estamos dizendo, né? porque participação, ela também se traduzem em modos de representação também distintos, não é? e, portanto tem aí um, a, a, um, um, um leque de, de, de concepções sobre teoria democrática, não é? e enfim, desde abordagens digamos elitistas, abordagens digamos mais enfim, de uma democracia direta e aí o conceito de participação e o que é participação uh, informada também varia, não é? é tem um, um texto que eu recentemente eu trombei com ele e gostei muito, que chama Saberes dos Cidadãos e Saber Político, Citizen Knowledge and Political Knowledge, do Yves Sintomer. E ele faz um pouco, tenta fazer uma, uma matriz uh, das relações entre as diferentes teorias democráticas uh, e pensando como elas também se traduzem em diferentes concepções sobre produção de conhecimento, enfim, na relação entre conhecimento local, conhecimento universal, e... É, me parece que o, o, acho que a contribuição aí é, de fato, também pensar as diferentes ah, escalas e né, instâncias do problema e como que elas implicam em diferentes ah, formas de atribuição de responsabilidade e de participação sobre elas. Não é? É, enfim, eu acho que é uma pergunta que a gente teria que explorar mais aí o, o, enfim, cada uma dessas linhas aí, mas eu queria só deixar essa pequena contribuição. É, e sobre a universidade, realmente acho que é uma uma pergunta muito extensa, mas assim acho que é, acho que é, dá para apontar muito rapidamente o que nós não gostaríamos que acontecessem, não é? Então acho que a partir de uma uh, talvez de um diagnóstico muito breve, não é? Mas uma coisa que tem me preocupado um pouco na universidade, sobretudo um pouco em algumas novas universidades, é que isso que nós estamos discutindo aqui em termos de ciência aberta uh, não está presente, não é? Ao contrário. Não é? Então isso que aqui, né, nas nossas discussões é um, é um campo, digamos, como uma tendência, não é? é emergente, em muitos lugares não é. Não é? Então isso é, é absolutamente marginal. Então ainda que pareça haver um movimento de abertura, compartilhamento de dados, as tecnologias é, é, expandindo aí, né, as formas de acesso e compartilhamento em muitos lugares não é isso que está acontecendo, não é? Então, a, a, e a forma, não é, de, de avaliação, de mensuração da atividade acadêmica, ela tem se fortalecido muito numa forma de mensuração de caráter muito individual, de uma produtividade individual. 
Então, isso tem criado, e aí não é uma, enfim, uma ampla pesquisa, enfim, uma coisa absolutamente, uma impressão, muito o campo da minha experiência, não é? Uma combinação muito estranha né, do que a gente poderia chamar de uma espécie de um capitalismo acadêmico, alta competitividade não é, entre os cientistas, capitalismo acadêmico com feudalismo informacional, sabe? É, que é um, um, um monstro meio estranho, mas é que que é está colocado aí como formas de resistência uh, ou forma de adaptação necessária para uh, se manter nos programas de pós-graduação, para ter critérios de produtividade elevada. É, então, dizer, se nós não pensarmos em, em formas de reconhecimento daquilo que é uh, o cimento, daquilo que é o alimento da universidade, que me parece assim a produção do comum, não é? aquilo que, de alguma maneira, é uma coisa que transborda e que é um, 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 um conhecimento... Uh, que circula também livremente, é, nós temos uma séria ameaça aí à, à universidade. Quer dizer, a universidade não se mantém só com bons currículos individuais, né, dentro daquela perspectiva do que é um bom currículo individual. Não é? Então, acho que essa é, uh, para mim, acho que talvez a maior ameaça e é aquilo que a universidade deveria evitar. Quer dizer, deveria propiciar formas não é, de, de produção colaborativa e, e reconhecer isso que não é exatamente o que está acontecendo na forma como ela está desenhada hoje na, na, avalia, na avaliação da performance individual dos pesquisadores. Né? Rapidamente. O, uh, the, the question, you know, who decides who, who benefits? It's essential, right? On, on everything. And maybe the most, not to say, let's have the answer, to continue to have the discussion where even that discussion is more participatory. It's essential. Through the discussion is where you'll, you'll, you'll get things, not just to say, here's the answer and let's you know, spread the answer. So to keep having and to keep pushing on exactly these questions, not just about open science. I mean, there are these essential questions about damn near everything, right? So how does that translate? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, the other side also, we, we often forget. So thinking a lot about why there's a lack of progress and a lack of change in education, which everybody, every country accepts as obsolete, not functioning well, inequitable, right? You know, except maybe Singapore, where you have so few people and it's persistent for how do you do for everybody. A few countries have come up with decent answers, like Finland. But education is a great space where it's like, It's not just, okay, if we think about something new, you know, how do we test it, how do we think, what's going to be better, what's going to be benefit, because in education is like a kind of biological system where we arrived at this point not because of design, but because of evolution. And so a lot of things that form our thinking because it's our experience, we think because if we think of education, a lot of this is informed by our personal experiences. Education happens in a school, in a classroom with a teacher in the front. Not because it's best, I mean, just, you know, kind of biological accident, right? Cultural accident. <laughs> and so to take this question, but to look backwards in the same way at the same time. You know, it's not just we're here because it's this, you know, ongoing linear progress, you know, we're just keep moving up the ladder and before we take the next step, what's going to be better? But to think about questions in more this kind of nuanced way. And in, you know, my personal formation, What's been really essential for thinking about almost everything is the role of high quality, equitable learning, education, as well as understanding of science for everybody in order to really have a kind of democratic, truly democratic way of discussing and answering this question, right? And, and you know, so going back to who decides who benefits, well, that discussion gets better with good intentions on the part of the discussants, with openness, right? With uh, the development of trust, with a way to kind of try things out and test, and really to be able to do this because, and it's in this practice, we should be able to get better, but this is our problem. Uh, someone from the World Bank once asked me, it's like where we were working, we're always where there was somewhat kind of enlightened social leadership in some form. And, and because it's where people are going to be more open to equity, democratic participation. So you're able to do some of these things where it's already pretty good, right? 
well, what do you do in a place that has this horrible dictator? You know, where you'd say it's more important than anything. How do you start to work in there where the who decides is taken away in a lot of, in most of life? So how do you start to intervene there where one extreme part of that question you could say is like, you can't intervene except where everybody's decided that you should. Because how does slavery end or genocide? Rwanda, boy, you, you can't think about anything without thinking about this and the horror and the fact that, you know, outside, there wasn't some way to deal with this. And all right, coming from the US, it's ridiculous to speak about the things with, you know, the invasion of the weak or the invasion of privacy of the m nanosecond, you know. So, uh, uh, you know, fully aware of this, you know, so like, what's the entity that you talk about for thinking about these things? Where for me, the most pos positive possible outcome is how you try to interact give tools, give access, give participation, social, economic, and in these kind of questions of who decides who benefits to everybody, always trying to raise this kind of level. It's a kind of development of what a colleague, friends calls, you know, collective efficacy. And, and, and this is the solution because otherwise, you know, it looks like between war and famine and, you know, environmental destruction, as we're deciding, we as a planet now, we're heading really quickly into oblivion. You know, maybe that's a good thing, you know, so, but uh, <laughs> given what humans are doing. I'm more optimistic, but I think it really takes this participation and this kind of really thinking beyond in order to do that. So this is what, for me, the importance of participatory, important, you know, equitable learning and open science is essential. Obrigada a todos. Nós...